It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. What a great panel. We have Christina Warren joins us from Microsoft. Brian McCullough, his first time on the show. Give him a great big welcome. He's from Tech Memes' new Ride Home podcast and, of course, the Internet History Podcast. Plus, Patrick Beja, our favorite Frenchman. We're going to talk, oh, so much to talk about. Google Duplex. Was it unethical? The advancing GDPR, it starts Friday. The impact of ad tech. China's new rules and Ireland's taxes and the Seattle business. I, I can go on and on, but I think what you should probably do is just sit back and relax and enjoy Twit. It's next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 667, recorded Sunday, May 20th, 2018. Give me your history hat. This Week in Tech is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Hiring? ZipRecruiter has revolutionized how you do it. Their technology identifies people with the right experience and then invites them to apply to your job. They find great candidates for you. Try it free today at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. And by LastPass, join over 13 million LastPass users and start managing and securing your passwords today. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit. And by Wink, the best way to discover new wines you'll love. Go to trywink.com slash twit and get $20 off your first shipment. And by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash twit2. This is Twit. Welcome, everybody, to the weekly roundtable show where we discuss the tech news of the week. And we're going to have some fun today. Patrick Beja is joining us. Uh, he is a longtime podcaster, FrenchSpin.com, and you've heard him on many shows, including DTNS and so forth. Hey, Patrick, it's good to see you back again. Hey, thanks for having me. It's nice to be back. It's been a while. He's in Finland, so we're going to talk about Eurovision. No, we're going to talk, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about GDPR. But uh, first, let's introduce the rest of the panel. Christina Warren is also here, senior cloud dev advocate at Microsoft Film Girl. Hello, Christina. Yes. Yay. Channel Nine <laughs> Live. I'm, Channel Nine Live, and I'm yeah, I'm doing this from my actual Microsoft office this time because wow. um, I was trying to find my uh, a USB C cable <laughs> on Friday. I was working from home and tore my actual office at home apart. You didn't have so a USB C cable? No, I did. And I couldn't find one, so because I was trying to find my switch, and and I, anyway, I tore things apart. Couldn't find it. Ended up order. It was faster to just order one from Amazon from Prime now and get it within an hour. Honestly, that's what I wound up doing because that's wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. So I didn't. I, I didn't want it to be messy as it always is when I'm on your show. I always feel terrible because like I, everyone sees what wreckage I live in. So now you can see uh, my office. How uh, how far away from your house is your office? Uh. It's like a, it's like 20, 25 minutes. Oh, well, thank you for driving all the way in. Oh, I took an Uber. It's fine. And oh. that's good. Not a problem. <laughs> oh, I took an Uber. It's okay. It's okay. It's very modern. Also with his first time, and I'm thrilled to have him, the host of the, the new Tech Meme Daily Podcast, Ride Home, Brian McCullough. Of course, you know him from uh, the Internet History Podcast. For You've been doing that since when? Uh, I, it's not quite five years. It's four. Cause it was right before my daughter was born and she just had her fourth birthday. Oh. So let's say four, four years and five months. Or That's something an easy like way that. to keep track of it. Yeah. Uh, again, Leo, like I said, everything happening at once. Yeah. <laughs> Launching podcasts, having kids. Yeah. And Brian uh, is, uh, writing a book right now too, about the history of the internet, which should be very interesting. Book is, book is written coming out in October called how the internet happened. Available for pre-order. Ooh. So it's written and they're holding it till October? Um, well, so you have, they give you the, the day, yeah. not, what are these? The galleys. Galleys, yep. So I still have to mark up the galleys. Oh, I hated um, that. I used to hate that. But right, I don't know what they do for the next six months once we lock down the actual, you know. Well, they set it in cold type, one <laughs> letter at a time, inch by inch. So 
Uh, we got a wait. We have, we have a few things to talk about. I want to ask you, Christina. I haven't seen you since Build. Did was Build fun for you? Did you have a good time? I did. I had a great time. I was extremely busy because I was um, executive producing the the Build live stream. So we had content Ooh. that was airing in between the sessions we were broadcasting live and ahead um, of the keynotes and then you know uh, end of the day wrap ups. And then we were also recording things on that stage. Um, when we were not live on the air. And so I was hosting stuff, but I was also coordinating all the content and guests and stuff. So I was very busy, but I had a great time and it was a good show. And it was uh, it was really interesting to be at Build, not as a reporter, but as a Microsoft employee. It was a little weird, but uh, but it was it was cool. Yeah, it's a very different way to, to see Build. What's your what was your takeaway? What 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 do you think was the most exciting stuff? <sighs> Obviously, I think a lot of the the focus on on uh, AI um, and kind of the, the the future potential around that, especially some of the the IoT um, edge stuff, was really interesting. I really like that DJI demo um, from a consumer perspective. Uh, I really want to see whatever the you know the phone, the your phone app um, uh, on, on on Windows 10 to see how well that will be able to integrate to kind of mirror things from um, you know your phone onto your computer. I think that's very cool uh, and. Um, we had we had, we had, we had many horses, Leo. Like that was there were many of, a lot of wood behind those horses. arrows. Yeah, no, there, there there were many horses. Like we had like little like bunnies and 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 puppies. Oh, and actual many horses. horses. Actual horses. Yeah, I built. <laughs> I'm we sorry, I misunderstood. <laughs> there no, there yeah, were actual no. equine yeah. animals. Yes, <laughs> they were therapy animals, and they were amazing. Are you and teasing me? Not, no, I'm not. I swear to God. Why would there? Real. Okay. I, therapy animals because and it was amazing and people very much enjoyed them and that was i know it wasn't like a tech you know announcement or whatever but i was very full-size horses or ponies mini horses like like little sebastian oh mini Park horses Park. yeah oh that's kind of cute yeah can i They're really cute people can you really bring them on them. a plane I mean, it's great um no it's from a local um therapy um uh, animal oh my God. Um, a place so wait a minute so not only in. was the keynote so long three hours and 45 minutes that they had you do uh, exercises <laughs> in the middle but right. then they trot out mini ponies for you to feel better. Afterwards. Yes, but that's why yeah, they it, had to have it. The the, <laughs> the keynote was so long. By the <laughs> end, we're of it, shaking. People needed the mini horses. You know what's funny, and I probably had something to do with how many things Microsoft announced at Build. But they held, I thought, one of the most interesting announcements for after Build, and I'm talking about the Surface yeah, Hub the, Two. The Surface Hub Two. Yeah. Now, have, are you using this in your conference room yet? Because this is the sweetest no, thing. No, no, I have not seen one in person yet, but I have used the the first Surface Hub, um, and that's amazing. And just this demo video, I have to say, like, and I this is not a reflection of where I work at all. This is seriously cool. Like, this is the sort of thing. Um, and it wasn't until I worked in in a big uh, corporate environment where you see a lot of these things that I actually understood the potential of this sort of stuff. Uh, but it's very cool. So Microsoft bought a company called Pixel Perfect, which made giant displays. They released the hub a year ago, right? Their initial hub. But this is the follow-up, Surface Hub 2. They haven't announced pricing. They say it'll be next year, I think, that it'll be available. But it's a giant Windows-based display that, well, has a couple of interesting features. Uh, there's one right now on the video we're watching, which is it can rotate from landscape to portrait mode, and you can then do Skype calls with a human, the f a full-size human standing across from you on, on this giant display. That's wild. Uh, it And then, it, of course, uh, you can put two side-by-side -side in landscape mode. Or, even cooler, if you put them uh, in the portrait mode, I think you can have, was it eight? You can have a bunch of I them. It's all four. It's maybe four it's four. The there it is, four, yeah. like that. Uh, all communicating with one another. Microsoft said they'll be less expensive than the existing Surface Hub, but I don't I don't know what that means. The existing Still Hub is pretty expensive. expensive. It's like eight thousand dollars for the fifty five inch. Well, the, now the Christina, demo is though, really impressive, but I wonder how does it actually work that well that you can send data from your computer to the thing? Like how how integrated does your system at work have to be for that to actually work like that? Because look if it this. does, it's look at magic. This, this is but so I, cool. Look at that. That's so, the four. The so it's four. basically, I, I I can't speak for whatever the new one is, but the existing one, which has some of the, the similar features where you can just wirelessly transmit things, it, it uses kind of like a, a custom version of Windows 10. And so if you have a, a Windows 10 device and if you're on the same Active Directory thing, and I'm not really sure how it all needs to be configured, then you can wirelessly send 
files very easily. And it, it actually does work really well. And then if you don't have, if you're using like a, an iOS or an Android or, or a Mac device, you can either use like it has Miracast built in. So if you were like on Android or, or you know, um, Chrome or like a, a non, um, you know, Surface, uh, like Windows machine that didn't have something, um, you could use Miracast to send stuff over. But there are also, there's apps like Aircast um, or, or Air Server, sorry, that'll kind of add like a, an AirPlay type of feature so you can still use that as, as a way to wirelessly send um, information. It works really well. I mean, obviously it works far better if everything's, if everything you're using is Windows 10. But it, but that's um, easily doable because this is so expensive. A company's going to buy this, they're going to buy it. And it's an integrated solution. I mean, you're going to, exactly. you're going to put it, you're going to wire a whole conference room to use no, you're this. Gonna, exactly. And then, and then it works with your phone system. So the, right. the, the really brilliant part, at, you know, assuming your phone system works and like, let's be honest, everybody's offices, you know, that's always like, that's always the part that's the big thing is you can walk in and you can touch a button and start the Skype call that's already been programmed into the room and, you know, and, and, yeah. and you can touch the screen or, or, or start it from your computer and then fling it to, you know, the, the hub, um, that's then, you know, recording stuff, um, but also, you know, projecting whoever is presenting information. I want, I'm hoping the price will be sub five, maybe sub $4,000. Cause I would, you know, we, when we first set up this, so right now we're doing the show there, I'm in the studio, but the rest of you are all on Skype. And what we do is we put you in TV screens around the round table. So it's like you're there, but I always wanted to have it be portrait mode, yeah. more full size. And I could tell, I would dig it if you guys were, you know, like <laughs> right here at the table, it would be, that was always the plan. You know, we just couldn't, it was too hard to make it work, too expensive to make it work. But maybe this will, maybe this time next year, Christine will be right here, just like that. That would be awesome. <laughs> That'd be amazing. Wouldn't that be awesome? So you do, at these events, you see demos. And, uh, and as many people are quick to point out, there's a big gulf between a demo and reality. And now, two weeks after Google I.O., we're hearing more and more people wondering about the Google Duplex uh, that they demoed. That's the very accurate voice assistant that called and made reservations for uh, dinner, that called and made haircut appointments. And maybe we were a little too blindly accepting of that. Google's now admitted, yeah, we edited it a little bit so you wouldn't hear the restaurant location. And that you could tell they didn't put last names in, things like that. John Gruber <laughs> said, hey, <laughs> let's figure out what restaurant they're in because they, they on, the, on the blog post for Duplex, they posted a picture. They said, we're eating the lunch that we booked with Google Duplex. And people responded on Twitter and found it. And then Mashable, yes, Mashable called uh, the restaurant following up uh, on this. And it was called Hong's Gourmet in Mountain View, of course, near the Googleplex. And uh, here's, uh, here's uh, uh, Jack Morse at Mashable writing, When I called, uh, a woman answered the phone after explaining I was reportable with Mashable and I was curious about Google employees eating there after using an AI to make reservations. She said, oh, well, let me put you on the phone with Victor. Victor got on the phone. I asked him if the AI had made a reservation. He said, yeah. I asked him, and this is important, if Google had let him know about the planned duplex test in advance. He said, no, no, of course not. And when I asked him to confirm one more time that duplex had called Hong's Gourmet, he appeared to get nervous and said he had to go and hung up. <laughs> so so, Leo, I mean, obviously, we're going to get into the the idea of the consenting to talking to a robot thing. But is the other half of this, are people starting to say that this was all staged and maybe this yes. technology doesn't work? Okay. One yes. of the reasons they say that is because California is a strict two-party state, as you know, Brian, which mm -hmm. means you cannot record a call unless both parties give consent explicit consent i'm recording i would not even i'm recording i know this because i work in radio in california you can't say you can't have somebody on the phone be recording and say i'm recording is that okay you have to say before you record i would like to record this do i have your permission when they say yes you press record then you say i got your permission to, to record this i would like you to say again i have your permission right yes that's the only way you get it, stay out of trouble I mean, none of that seemed to have happened with google 
So, well, um, but the but the other thing is is because as people then did follow up right away, and 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 on the blog post, Google admitted this that it's already a very constrained system. Like you can't, right? You couldn't talk to the computer right now and have it pass a Turing test or whatever. Like you wouldn't be fooled. Well, they, I was, you know, they, and this is my fault because I thought it passed. The, I thought this is the Turing test. But because, only for ordering or, or checking hours okay. or making a reservation. But still, so it's a very constrained use case. <laughs> it, right, it, it's and, the, and the human wasn't it's asked to. It. it was half of it. The human wasn't asked to distinguish between a human, a computer, and a human. And had they been asked, maybe they would have been able to tell that that voice. Well, that was a little odd, so maybe it wasn't a human. But it was pretty impressive. Right. It was a great Which demo. Is, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, which is my question. Are people now starting to suggest that, oh, this technology, it, 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 it's, it's, it's kind of vaporware-ish where like, oh, yeah, that'd be great if it works, but it, it's, it's still five years away and they tricked us off. Well, I mean, we don't know, um, but it comes down to whether or not you trust Google with these kinds of things. And I can imagine that it's not completely ready yet for prime time. But if Google is making that kind of demo, I, I can't imagine that it wouldn't be close enough that in a few months or maybe a couple of years, it will work reliably well. It will not be as perfect as, as this, but I would be very surprised if, you know, it's completely doctored and fabricated. And this is what some people are kind of implying, like, ah, oh, it was right. edited, so it's it, 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 it holds no value, basically. They lied to us. I think that's a bit over the top. I agree with that. Although I do have to say, like, I, I definitely think that the most people who watched it when I first saw it, and I think it's a very impressive demo. And I think it, it we should we should acknowledge the fact that nearly two weeks later, the fact that we're still talking about this, regardless of it's because people have questions about it or not, is goes to the strength of the demo. We are still talking about this. But but for me, you know, when I saw it, as impressive as it was, my spidey sense was kind of like, okay, well, this is not ready the way that they are showing this. This was a very specific scenario. This is a best case scenario demo as most demonstrations are, and this has probably, probably been edited even more so. That said, I think that because there is so much ambiguity around, you know, how do they call, what were the parameters, um, what types of, of information is, is required on the other end, what signals does it pick up on, um, what are some of the, the, the broader privacy implications, what are some of the broader ethical implications, people are starting to ask those other questions. Uh, but I, but I, I kind of feel like they're two different things. And while I, I'm perfectly happy to have people kind of talk about like how real of a demo is this, sometimes I feel like some of the criticism about this, which is getting into the two-party consent laws and all that stuff, is kind of going into a rabbit hole, which shouldn't really be the focus. I feel like if we should be focusing on the ethical implications of this, we should be talking about the broader AI implications of talking to AIs and, and, and things calling and how should they be identifying themselves and not trying to nitpick a doctor demo and say, well, did they, you know, did they announce they were making the recording and did the restaurant know? Because I don't feel like Google would have put recordings on the internet if they didn't have them cleared in some way. I don't know. Maybe they would, well, but I feel like Google's lawyers wouldn't do that. They need to step forward and say that because I, I would disagree with you to this extent. If they play fast and loose with this now, that is a problem down the road because companies that create are creating AIs are going to, I think, have a very high eth ethical bar that they have to yes. cross. To, to I mean... And so if the, if if there's questions at this early stage, that's a little troubling. Um, oh, it's no, mostly I, I TechCrunch, by the way, and we should say this is TechCrunch has decided to make this be their, you know, they're they're going to really go after Google on this one. Here's but there are others. Here's Zainab Tufeki, who I really love. I I think she's brilliant. She tweeted, "Google Assistant making calls, pretending to be human, not only without disclosing that it's a bot, but adding um and ah." to deceive the human on the other end with the room cheering it, horrifying. Silicon Valley oh, is ethically lost. On. Rudderless has not learned a thing. No? You disagree, no. Patrick? No, completely. I mean, I understand, you know, there's such a thing as hyperbole, and I think this is a fine example of it. Um, I, I understand why there would be concern about the way they went about doing it, but the 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 phrasing she uses and the phrasing that some others have been using, I think is uncalled for. 
and that is the problem with the internet, right? Everything, every little issue yeah, yeah. becomes a world the ending tiniest. problem. Yes, and yes. Yeah, and, and I completely understand that we should ask the question and go to Google and say, hey, wait a second now. So this is what you did. Did you, did you start thinking about the uh, ethical implications of this? Should we know when a bot is calling? And in this case, the point is that we shouldn't know so that it can use systems that haven't been prepared for automated uh uh, uh, booking, but going that far, I think is, I'm not going to say disingenuous. I don't know who she is, but it's at, at the very least, it seems like hyperbole that I, I'm wary of these days. Zainab is so, a very well-known academic who uh, writes about these subjects and has been very outspoken about, uh, com uh you know, companies, uh, being, you know, uh, surveillance capitalism and companies being uh, really intrusive. Mm. So this is, this well, is, a, I think that's fair. I yeah. mean, look, I, I think that there it are very concern, serious course. ethical questions. I think there are huge ethical questions around this. My bigger question, honestly, though, other than this specific demo, and this is where I kind of get hung up on this. Like, I feel like there are very big 10,000 foot questions we should be asking about this whole project. I just don't know if it behooves us to focus on the intricacies of the demos they showed off. I bet we should be asking questions of the program. When we talk about two party consent, I don't really care if they asked on these calls for two-party consent if, if, if Hong's restaurant gave permission to be recorded or not. That doesn't really, like, that. that's going down a rabbit hole. What concerns me more is, are they going to be capturing these calls? Because presumably they are. And because they're going to be using it, you know, for, for their, their machine learning models. And in that case, how is it going to be identified? And how is that going to work with the law? And how are people going to be notified that they're talking um, to, to machines? Um, back, like that to me is a much bigger question. Back to Leo's point though, I think the fact what he said right at the beginning that this is so early in in this sort of AI stuff that we're going to have to encounter over and over again. There was a great, I don't remember if it was a Twitter thread or a blog post or whatever, but it was some computer scientists that made the point that every other discipline has had its um, its moment of being chastened by their technology being more than they thought it would be. So the reason we have a Nobel Prize is because chemists thought that they were discovering, you know, the, yeah, the building Nobel blocks of the universe. Dynamite. <laughs> and they invented dynamite. Yeah. And then obviously physicists <laughs> thought they were unlocking the secrets right. of the atom and the Big Bang. And then yeah. they had, you know, created nuclear weapons. Right. And so his point was computer scientists and, and computer science as a discipline hasn't had that moment yet. And he was like, I would hope that as computer scientists, we would get ahead of that. It wouldn't take, oh, we've created a nuclear bomb right. to like- Now let's figure it, out. Now let's solve the problem. Right. If right. you're a biologist, you know, I think to Leo's point and to Zainab's point is that computer science tends to, oh, this is a cool thing. Let's just do it. Whereas if you're, right. if you're a, a biologist, you don't just create a new virus just because you can. You know, you, there, you, you, you think and about is, it and you put safeguards in place. This is what Satya Nadella was talking about at Build. He was talking about I, ethics. I, I was going to say, I mean, I, I, and, and I'm trying not to come across like a shill here, but one of the things that like I think about a lot and the people that I work with think about a ton, people who are actively involved in the AI stuff, and I'm certainly not. I just kind of you know talk to developers about things around it, are ethics. And I think that it's something that every major company who's involved with AI, including Google, is very involved with. Now, how much of an emphasis you put on that in your consumer facing demos is a different question, but I am heartened and at least I'm hopeful. I mean, maybe I, I'm a little worried as well, but I am hopeful that the, the experts who are working on this have to be aware of these things because if they're not, governments who don't understand the tech are going to start putting limitations on what can be done. And that has, in my opinion, the, the, the potential to be even more damaging. So there are companies who are actively thinking about the ethical concerns with this stuff. And, and I think that it's a conversation that everyone needs to have and that all of the, the scientists doing this really serious, the engineers doing this really serious work need to be thinking about because you're right. We don't want to be in a situation where we've created a nuclear weapon before we know it without even realizing. Sundar Pichai we could have predicted it. did echo uh, Nadella's briefly in one, for one sentence, Nadella's, ethics thing and i but i i you know this is timely because uh tonight on 60 minutes there's going to be a piece uh that already has hurt google's stock price the price went down on friday called the power of google uh that's uh i think going to be a little bit critical of google's power uh there's gdpr which is becoming law on friday we're going to talk about that there's a, I think, you know, this is what Scott Galloway was talking about in the four. There's, there is a reckoning coming to Silicon Valley. It hit Facebook. 
maybe it's Google's turn, where people are saying to them, we expect you not just to do it because it's cool. And I think one of the things, Patrick, your response, I think, is was my response, too, which is, oh, this is cool, this is great, let's not shoot the baby before it's born. But I think some of that comes from, tell me if I'm right or wrong, Patrick, the fact that we think it's that's cool and I can't wait. I'm excited about AI. But that's the problem is that engineers might not think about the consequences because we're just so excited. I, I think we are currently in a context where we are overly sensitive to ethics in IT issues. And certainly they are there is a good reason for it and it is needed. I do also think, however, that in this specific case, uh, the concern is putting a little bit of the cart before the horse. Uh, this is a very specific use case and it couldn't have been done. I think, you know, you don't lay down ethics rules before you even know what the system is going to entail. This is basically a test uh, and you do the test and you see what happens and then you, you start, you know, you're, you might be thinking about the ethical implications beforehand, but you don't come out with this demo and say, I mean, okay, let's try this. Well, well, well then should you what come out with the demo the if you don't have those things there? there no, but what, apparently, what is, according what to some the articles, here? there what were people the, at Google that were mad that they de that they pushed this out as a, f you know, that's a very big stage. This is Google's biggest stage of the year that they pushed Google Duplex out. They And there are people at Google, apparently, who felt like this was not the time to do that. But I understand ethics first. Right. But in this case, this is like research. You know, it's not application. It's not really application. But didn't yet. they I say mean, it's yes, going to be this year that they're going to do they, it? They, I mean, they, I mean, said they, they made gonna, it seem like it's a product. So, yeah. They, they okay, said they were going to try to start adding it to the Google Home. Now, I don't think that we could like use it in our Google Home by the end of the summer, but they were going to start testing it in Google Home use cases by the end of the summer. Yeah. We are all computer literate people. What are the dangerous things that could come out of this specific use case. Are you kidding? And what is the ethical? <laughs> <laughs> what? Are you kidding? I, 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 you can make anybody make say anything. You, If you can have John Legend read Sundar Pichai, his daily schedule, you can have anybody say anything at any time. I mean... This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about the calling. This is what people are upset about. People are upset that they didn't know it was a bot calling the, the hair salon. Yes, because it's, and, and Google made every effort to make it sound as if it's a human. Of uh, course, yeah, because because this is a, a system that is supposed to overcome the issue of uh, the the businesses that haven't uh, uh, implemented an online booking system. So well, but so said, people are saying, well, should deception be your primary goal here, deceiving the human? Of, yes. Why this shouldn't it? What would be wrong okay. if it said? You know, hi, this is the Google Assistant. I'm uh, calling to help make an appointment. Would you like to yeah. help me? It doesn't have to say, this hi, this is, hi, I'm calling for Sarah. I'd like to make an appointment for ladies' haircut. Um, okay. What people are asking for is uh, for this uh, a caller, robot caller, to say, hi, this is the Google Assistant, and I'm calling for a client. He would like to make an, uh, an appointment on Wednesday for a haircut. Yeah. Is that... Okay, this is. I'm Let's sure not deceive people as whatever. your very first goal in artificial intelligence. <laughs> I think that's the kind of thing I, that we as geeks go, isn't that cool? It sounded just like a human, but it legitimately is concerning for most other well, people, right? Well, as a I, business proprietor, just, I might not want a bot calling me. I mean, no, that's my choice as a business owner. If I choose not to have an automated booking system, I might not be comfortable knowing that someone's going to be calling me. It's taking petty fraud. My divorce data. It's, yeah. it's petty fraud. I mean, I acknowledge that. It's not, you know, I mean, it's not like, but it could be, I think it could be expanded to something less petty. The technology is, is concerning, is it not? I mean, Patrick, yes, I, yes. Well, I, I actually, I feel like I could, arg I could argue both sides of this because for two days, all I all I was doing on, on my pod was talking about how great this was and describing the demo and reading Me the too. blog post. Me too, and that's why I and feel right. guilty, Brian. And, and then <laughs> and then I start hearing these other things, yeah. and it makes a lot of sense to me. And your answer, your response, where you said, "Well, let's just do it because it's cool. Like let's not let's not cut it off before we find out what it is." But I think what Zainab and and people like her specifically are saying is that we can't you can't run things that way anymore. Like you do need, you can't just do a cool thing and release it. You should at least give some thought to the implications. And the fact that it seems like Google thought this was just cool 
and it worked. It worked on me. It worked on Leo. Yeah. But then, but then didn't do any further thinking beyond that. I think that that's what when we talk about these ethics and things like that's what all people are asking for is is do the next step thought, maybe one or two steps down the line. So. Just to clarify, I'm not saying there aren't ethics implications. That's not what I'm saying. But it's about the hyperbole. I think what people are asking for is for the Google Assistant to disclose the fact that it's the Google Assistant at the beginning of the call. That's my impression of what most people were asking for. And that doesn't appear to me like it's a huge deal. Like if the bot is calling you and it's saying, hi, this is the Google Assistant and I'm calling on behalf of my client, blah, blah, blah. And then you're fine with it. And it wasn't a huge deal to begin with. You know, it wasn't the world ending scandal that many people are making it into, right? If, if you don't want these things to exist, it's a different deal. But if the disclosure in the beginning of the sentence is enough to put your mind at ease, then it's not worth flipping the whole table over, I think. It's worth talking about. Fair enough. But and, and, and by doing it, of course, Google started the conversation, whether intentionally or not. And I think that it's an important conversation to have about the... the uh, the ethics and impact of this kind of thing. Um, it's, it's, hey, it was impressive. And not like you, Brian, I feel a little guilty at being so impressed. I'm still <laughs> impressed. Don't get me wrong. I am very impressed. <laughs> yeah. I felt like, hey, you, you, we just saw something that, that you're going to look back and say, I saw the world change on that day. Mm -hmm. I think it's that important. And, and it's going to keep, I mean, it's going to happen as well. Right. Yeah. I think. Well, of there course is a, it is. I think we just a little bit. There's a little bit of uh, you know fear of something new that I think is not going to be as uh, 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 fearful, afraid, scary <laughs> is the word I'm looking for. Uh, once it's a little bit more commonplace. I, th I think, though, that there are valid reasons, because as you said, this is going to happen regardless. We don't know when. I think that there are valid reasons to question how far along this really is. I'm a little bothered, maybe with the rollout and the way this was kind of productized, if these issues haven't been worked out or if Google is not willing to share their thoughts on them. I think that's a little problematic if you're going to sell this as a productized thing, and yet you don't have some of these very... I think, reasonable questions to have answered. But this is going to be a reality. And then eventually it's going to become more mainstreamed. You know, you look at like deep fakes and, and, and how real and how easy those tools are to use. You have to start thinking about, well, what about if, if this sort of thing starts being used in other contexts and people just put it up on GitHub or wherever and start sharing models and using these in more nefarious ways. And, and that's, I think, like, I'm not trying to be hyperbolic. And I, I understand your point and not, you know, saying this is the end of the world. But I think the reason people become concerned about this is because we do know how fast this is moving. We do know that this is uh, an eventuality. And if we don't start at least having the conversations now and putting basic practices into place, then it will be much easier for a deep fake type of situation to come up where people can have really uh, not great scenarios where, where you feel like someone's calling you to do phishing scams or to get personal information from you that you, you're you not aware of. Like, me, I, th I think that's also like a, thing. a hypothetical of all of you and everybody listening. How what would it what will it be like how will it feel in a, you know in 5 years when you interact with things and you're just not sure if that's a human or a computer is is are we just going to be is be okay with that and you just we don't have a choice google is probably going to say hi i'm the google assistant but there are many other actors that might yeah, not. So and I is, think is the, that okay with the, you? the solution, no, of course it isn't. But it's the reality. It's like deep fakes and the fact that we got used to the idea that Photoshop exists and any image it's could more, be it's real more, or it's could not be it's, real. it's more pervasive than that, though, that you could go through your day. I guess we already do that to some degree with email and stuff. But that you could go through your day, talk to people, interact with people that aren't people. And, and you may not know. I, there's something a little disconcerting about that, but maybe that's just you, something you will all get used to. Patrick, Westworld. you could yeah, you like could Westworld. say that, right, but you could. The the point is, is that you could think through those things now. So, if if Leo's right that he doesn't want to live in that sort of a world, if you're Google and you're you're the closest to this technology, you could think one or two steps ahead and start to think of ways that would maybe 
ease Leo's mind a bit, right? So it's the not thinking about it. Like one of the reasons that this got picked up is because every single talk radio show in yeah, the country all talked it. about it the next day. Everybody played said, it. I they played all it. Said, Everybody played it. The next it. caller, will the next caller be real? How yeah. will we know? Yeah. So if you think even for a second, <laughs> well, you would know that that it would be the thing that would be picked on, picked up on. So again, in not even just the ethical sense, but clearly they didn't think it through in the PR sense. And so all we're asking for is maybe think a little bit and, and then maybe put in, in and place do some what? safeguards. And do what? And do safeguards, what? Tell me what safeguards that would, that would ease the minds of people like Leo. Like Specific make the voice. Well, don't use me as the example. How do you feel about it, Brian? <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind that what your your scenario of interacting on a daily basis. Yeah. I wouldn't mind that. What I would what would slowly disturb me is I wouldn't know when I was being manipulated. Yes. See? Because it's the same thing as using the Photoshop example, using the deep fake example. Um it, it would be I there would be some invisible threshold that would be crossed. I think and it's, I wouldn't know I when think I was you'd being manipulated. Be, I think it everybody will be it's disorienting. It's the same problem. We have now where we don't know what's true and what's not true, what's a fact and what's not a fact. It would be disorienting if you're interacting in the world. Our biological, our biology is that we're interacting with other humans, but we can't tell. It would be highly disorienting. Christina, so Patrick, do, you not, do you think so? Yeah, no, I think it would be disorienting. Um, I also, like, I'm not opposed to the idea of interacting with AIs, especially if they can do their, uh, you know, respond appropriately. Uh, the fear that I have, frankly, in some of this stuff, and we've already seen this with like the first generation of assistants is a lot of times they don't work the way that, they, that the demos show that they will. So instead you have to have very specific, you know, inputs and output to, to, to get specific outputs. And so if, you know, if these things can trick people maybe to hand over a credit card number or, or a social security number, that's really scary. But then if I'm actually just trying to have something book an appointment for me, and it has to, you know, the, the person on the other end has to say a certain set of keywords for, for it to trigger, then it's not even accomplishing anything. Right. So my fear in some cases is that it might not work that well and then might work well enough to trick people. But for me, and maybe maybe this is just unrealistic, I almost feel like if I knew I'm talking to an AI, I would feel better about it. It's not like I would necessarily have a problem interacting with it. I would just know kind of what to expect and maybe know how to augment my responses better if I don't get the expected response back. Um, I don't know. It's a really good conversation. I mean, it's funny because for the longest time, you know, I saw her and I thought, oh yeah, I can't wait to have a assistant in my ear that sounds like Scarlett Johansson or, or, or <laughs> Christina Warren. And I'm talking and we're having a conversation. It's like a real person. I think that sounds really cool. But now as we get closer, I'm starting to think maybe it's not that cool. Maybe it's a little creepy. I don't know. <laughs> I, I do think we don't know what's going to be cool about it and what's going to be creepy. Um, you know, we were talking the, the, the very interesting point about uh, chemists and physicists having their reckoning moment. They had the moment after they realized yeah. what was what what what. The, the wrong use was. And I think to an extent we with the fake news issues and with the uh, very targeted uh, uh, campaigning that we've seen on social networks, now we understand how these things can be used uh, badly. I, I'm not sure, you know, we look at this AI technology and conversational AI and we're thinking, oh, it could be used for phishing scams and stuff like that. But we're just applying the, the issues that we already know of right. in another it context. We all right? new stuff. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's going to be completely different. Let me so play, it's really uh, hard to, to regulate this yet. Either that... Or I'm really just trying to, uh, uh, you know, look really good to our AI overlords when they find <laughs> the cover, they can look at this. And well, and it's just one of many things. Okay. Somebody in the chat room is mentioning CRISPR. We're going to have genetic modification in the very near future. We're going to have all sorts of issues that we are very ill-prepared for. And I like that. I like I, I, what you said about the, the 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 reckoning didn't happen until it was too late. Here's Robert Oppenheimer, the, the creator of the atomic bomb. These are the words he spoke. Um, after he saw the first test at Alamogordo. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the life. 
line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. So that's that, that's the that's the reckoning, and of course, then it's too late. You know. Well, uh, not to make light of any of this, but I'm going to get so much hate for this. Yes, there were a couple of really bad things that happened, and it was unspeakably terrible. But overall, I think we would agree that the research on the atom was more beneficial than it was. Uh, unbeneficial, detrimental. Um, and once the bad thing happened and we knew what it was, we took the steps to, until now at least, maybe it's going to change in, a, in the next few years, but until now, we've managed it barely, but we've managed it. Yeah. So... Yeah, you I, said earlier, just, you said earlier it, it's inevitable, and you're right. Like the, the idea of the technology fission to split the atom, once people figured out it was possible, it was inevitable that it would be done at some point, right? So I agree with you in the sense that there was probably no way to put a law in place that say we will we will never create fission technology. But at the same time, that happened at an accident, at a moment in history when we were at war. So immediately the government took control of atomic energy and things like that, where it remains today locked down within government control and things like that. Um, Which and, is probably a good thing. <laughs> right. So just, just things like that. Again, if we have another thing like that, will we have the same ability because we won't be at war or we might not want the government to do right. it or whatever. But, you know, not everybody can create a, a, a reactor and a shoebox in their bedroom right. um, for various reasons, but also because like all the governments in the world immediately – found ways to control it and and make it manageable yeah it's a i mean it's a very complex discussion it's in my mind because i i just came back from hiroshima and nagasaki and so but it's extremely complex and i there's no right i don't know what the right answer is and there's a lot of reasons why we had to do it first if the germans had done it first that might not have been a very good thing you could make the argument that the war would have gone on a lot longer had they not used it in the same time you know i saw a child's bicycle you know, fried uh, by an atomic bomb. I mean, there's it's it's very difficult. It's very difficult, and this is the problem that we. And I think this is exactly what Nadella was talking about. As uh, as as creators of technology, it's really important that we constantly be aware of what we're creating. And this is, I think, the I, I'll end it with this: that the, the 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 reason this comes up is because we have seen with social media a technology gone wild that we really didn't anticipate the consequences of. Uh, and maybe would have worked better had we thought it out a little bit more clearly ahead of time. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think we could have anticipated this. Yeah. Uh, you know, the the. I'm not going to go into the political aspects. It's of fascinating, it, but no isn't it? Though this is the was, human condition. It is. We come up with this yeah. stuff. It happens, and then we have to deal with it. I don't think there's ever been a case where we said, "Oh, let's not do. Let's not create that bomb. Let's not create that weapon. Let's not." That's never happened, and that's not going to happen here either. It's going to happen. It's just uh, it's nice, and it's not just it. bombs and weapons. I think no. it's important too. Technology, we humans are technology creation machines. That's what we do. It's fa I think it's fascinating myself. Let's take a break. We got a lot more to talk about. I want to talk since you're here, Patrick, and uh, Patrick's in Finland, but obviously he's French, and uh, I would <laughs> love to talk to a European about GDPR. Uh, and, and its impact, because Friday, it, it all happens. Uh, our show today, though, brought to you by ZipRecruiter. If you're hiring, ZipRecruiter has com completely changed the most important job in any company. If you were, let's say you're uh, America's Cup skipper and you're trying to hire a crew, that crew is going to make or break you, right? You can have the technology, you can have the boat, you can have it all, but, you're, but you want to get the best people. Any company, it's like that. You're 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 creating an entity that where everybody, if everybody works in the same direction and works well, you're going to 
go to the moon. And you, but it's easy enough to get somebody who's just going to bring you down. When you've got an opening, it's important to remember you're you're actually creating something really important. And it's nice to have tools to make that possible. ZipRecruiter takes technology to hiring to really improve the process. So in a couple of ways. First of all, it, it helps you reach that perfect person. You, let's assume that, you know, a great employee is out there, but where are they? With ZipRecruiter, you post to 100 sites with one click. So you're reaching the maximum number of people. But, they, but it does even more because they already have tens of millions of resumes, current resumes on file. So ZipRecruiter built a platform that goes through them and finds the right candidates for you, identifies people with the right experience, and invites them to apply to your job. They become your ally in, in finding the perfect person. It's really revolutionized how people find their next hire. 80% of employees who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in one day. In one day. And you know, when you're down a man or woman, filling that job becomes pretty important. ZipRecruiter, by the way, doesn't stop there because whenever you use ZipRecruiter, all of the applicants, they don't come to your phone or your inbox. They all flow into the ZipRecruiter interface. In that interface, they spotlight the strongest applicants. So you're never going to miss a great match. Look, the right candidate is out there for that job. ZipRecruiter is how you find that person. Businesses of all sizes, including Twit, use ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. Right now, you could try ZipRecruiter free. Right now, free if you go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Twit. ZipRecruiter.com slash Twit. The smartest way to hire. ZipRecruiter.com slash Twit. We thank them for their support of the Twit podcast so i read a, gr a great article which made me feel a, lo a lot better about gdpr i have such mixed feelings about gdpr on the one hand this uh, general data protection regulation that the eu uh put into law two years ago but now is actually going to go into effect on friday does things that everybody would agree are uh, are good for instance requires companies that have a data breach to disclose within 72 hours, I mean, really fast, and also put some real teeth into those laws. These, these regulations have existed, but there was no enforcement in the past. Now there will be. In fact, this is a really good example of what happens uh, if you, you make a law or you make a regulation. What was the, there was a privacy, what was the name of the privacy regulation, Patrick, that it's been in, it's been in effect for a year or, or two. Uh, I'm not sure which one the, you're can't remember the referring name of it. to. I mean, there there uh, are the things right, the right like the right to be forgotten. No, not that. But there's a there's a general privacy rec regulation that effectively was GDPR, but had no teeth, and has been in place for a while. Oh, I'll look it up. In any event, the EU decided, well, we've got to have some. You know, if this is going to work, we've got to have a significant penalty, and the penalty is fairly significant. The as much as twenty million euros. 20 million euros or 4% of your global revenue, whichever is higher, that's enough even to scare a big company like Google or Facebook. Clearly, it's intended for them. Um, but, so uh, some things I think I'm in favor of. Then there are other things that I think a lot of people are very worried about, uh, that, that compliance will be difficult. I read a good article. that This is uh, Jacques Matei, I think you pronounce it. He wrote a piece uh, on his blog called GDPR Hysteria, which calmed me down a lot. <laughs> he said, he said, you know, it's, it's in here. It's in here, Leo. It's the European Data Privacy Directive. That's that was it. the previous one. That's yeah. it. Which which was kind of a first attempt, but didn't do anything because it had no teeth. Um, so he's pointing out, look, this isn't going to happen overnight. You're going to get a, if you're out of compliance, you're going to get a warning. That, you know, they're not. That's the maximum fine. There, there may not be a fine at all if you fix it. Uh, I am in favor of privacy. What is so? And but I think also here in the states, a lot of people say, "How dare the EU tell us how to run our business?" <laughs> well, they're not. Um, they're telling you that that's what you have to do if you have customers in the EU. They could perfectly make two different sets of 
rules and settings, one for the EU customers and one for the US customers. Now, of course, it would get interesting reactions from the US uh, uh, customers and the press, I'm guessing, because the EU customers would have settings and rights to delete their data, portability of their data, downloading what you have uh, used on their network. And magically, the U.S. customers wouldn't. So Actually, for a while, we thought Facebook it. might do that. They might implement it just for EU customers. They, they said then later, uh, no, we're going to implement it for everybody. In fact, it's great. You can download your Facebook data now. You can delete your Facebook data now if you want. That's a good thing. Yeah. It's, you know, it's the power of government. Uh, yes, government is sometimes uh, mm -hmm. overbearing and cumbersome, but sometimes you need it because it's the only entity that can have some kind of influence on other more, you know, very uh, potent entities like some huge companies. Yeah. And I, I, I do think that, I mean, Europeans have always been more concerned with all of these issues than uh, the Americans for a couple of reasons. Historically, uh, we have more genuine concern about all of this and the way our data is used and of course we don't the, those big companies are usually not uh in the eu so we have an easier time looking at them and saying oh these right <laughs> that's one of the internet that's giants one, that's one of the under the subtext of all of this is oh here comes the eu after successful american companies again yeah, but no one is saying that what is being required of those companies is completely unreasonable. No, not um, at all. Especially fact. for the big ones, right? Yeah. It, yeah. It's things that really they should have implemented themselves a long time ago. And I've been, I, I went off on a tiny, tiny rant on Twitter because after the 25th email I received from one of those companies <laughs> saying, at company X, we value your privacy. And this is why we're All doing of a this. Sudden. If, yeah, if you valued our privacy, you wouldn't have waited until the law obliged you to do these things yes. to put them into place. You know, they like, I would have preferred that some of them would say, hey, so the GDPR, GDPR is coming into law and it requires this and this, or so we're making these modifications. You didn't have to put that, that you know, hypocritical PR spin to it mm -hmm. saying, well, of course they did have to do it because that's how they work, but it's a little bit frustrating. But it's, you know, I understand the concerns. And again, I think it's good to ask and and discuss them. But overall, I have a hard time justifying uh, uh, a, a full uh, uh, criticism of this GDPR uh, ensemble of requirements. It yeah. seems like things that should have been uh, uh, put into place maybe earlier. And I have to admit that myself, I might have been a little bit skeptical about all of it until a couple of years ago. But I think now it's clear to everyone in Europe that it's needed. And I'm guessing in the US, most people agree. I agree that it's needed. And I, and I think that that you make, I, I basically agree with everything you said. I do have some questions still about how this is actually going to be enforced. I think if you're a larger company, a Facebook, a Google, a Microsoft, an Apple, uh, a, a Samsung, um, an Amazon, you obviously are going to, to be in compliance because you're going to be watched very carefully. But if you are a Chinese based company or if you are a, a, a you know, um, a, you know, Eastern European based country who's not part of the EU um, or if you are just smaller and don't care, I, I am curious about how thing, these things are actually going to be enforced. I think actually that's well, why Leo mentioned this piece specifically because I read this earlier in the week also, Leo. And, and the point that he's making is that he's specifically saying, are you just a person that has a blog? Are you going to be on the hook for $20 million or whatever in fines? And he's saying, no, that's not the way that the EU works. Things like the, the, D, the DPD, the European Data Protection Directive, he said – that's that's been in effect for two decades. Two decades. Have you never? But you've never <laughs> even heard of it because the point is not that they wanted to suddenly fine everyone. They wanted to talking, have the laws not, in the place. Right. Right, and I understand that. What I'm saying is I'm not necessarily talking about like your website or a small company right. who I, I, I'm talking about potentially big conglomerates, big industries big players who are based in countries that just aren't going to care. Like, how are they going to enforce mm. this against someone like Tencent, for instance, or mm. or someone else? Like, you know, well, if someone's really going to come back, I mean, that's that becomes the interesting question. Are you going to start blocking access to their traffic? Like, like what, what, how much teeth is this really going to have? And I guess we will have to see on that because what we've seen before with Right to be Forgotten and and other sanctions that have gone against, you know, Google um, and, and, and other companies 
those companies tend to fight back even when it is the law. So I don't know. Yes, but but the right to be forgotten has been implemented. I, I, initially, I thought it was a horrible idea, uh, but it has been implemented by Google and it seems to work relatively well. Of course, there are, there are always issues in every uh, uh, Oh, I still think like that this, one's a horrible law because it, it, yeah, it, instead of, of saying pull down the original content, they're putting the burden on the search engine to pull down the search results. They're also putting Google Google into in the position of judge and jury. Google has to go through each of these requests and judge whether it has merit or not. That's not something Google should yes, be but, doing. Yeah, yes, but Leo, this is the practical approach to problems. Sometimes the solution is not perfect, but it's better than doing nothing. This is what we're asking of uh, YouTube, of Facebook, of Twitter. We're telling them, take away the objectionable content within 24 hours. This is horrible. It shouldn't be on the internet. Yeah. And, and my initial concern was we're asking private enterprises to be the judge of what is acceptable right. and, or not acceptable to say. I agree. This is a valid concern. However, uh, on, the other, on the other side of it, uh, and I'm sure some people would, would have more to say about it than, than me, but you see some horrible things on Twitter. And sometimes you are very frustrated that it's still there and that the, the accounts aren't blocked. And so the is the right thing to do to go to Google and say, hide that Twitter search result or to go to Twitter and say, pull the tweet down? And that's the problem well, I have with right to be forgotten. It makes Google responsible for this, not the site that hosts it, the bad content. I think in the case of Twitter... Uh, obviously, you would go to Twitter. Yes. But there are many, many other uh, but the right to be forgotten where, is about Google. Yes, right? absolutely. And and it's not about uh, the, the link to Twitter. If it's a link to Twitter, you're going to go see Twitter. It's a, a, a general uh, – uh, because in practice, Google is our doorway to the internet, especially right. in Europe. Remember, they yeah, have 80%, 90% uh, uh, yeah, market share in Europe. Andy and in Germany is in the chat room, and he says, you still, you still have to delete the content from the original sites by yourself. You go to those sites. But the reason Google is in the equation is because they cache all this stuff, so you have to get them to kill the cache as well, I guess. I don't know. As, well, not no, 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 not just the cache. They also have to kill the link. They have the to result. hide the link. Right. Yeah. The, but if the, the content's the gone, what does the link matter? Of course, yes, but usually the issue is that the the content is more difficult to get. What about to. the Internet Archive, which I think is a really yeah. valuable, important thing. The Wayback Absolutely. Machine uh, I, keeps well, is saving the internet. No, nobody's saving the internet; it's disappearing. Yeah. Absolutely, Leo. I completely agree. But I will answer to you what I, I basically would like to formulate to Christina about the concerns that she was voicing, which is, be, it's not you know there, you're always going to have issues is in any system in any rule in any law you're you can point out uh, uh instances where it doesn't work or it, where it breaks something but uh, uh, having a few exceptions where it doesn't work out well doesn't mean that you shouldn't do something about a i problem. agree w without a doubt i agree and to be clear although i actually have a lot of issues especially from a first amendment perspective with the right to be forgotten i have serious serious issues about that um i don't have a problem with gdpr and i think i i, I think that these are things that i'm with they're I'm very with you. different these are, yeah. I, absolutely and i think these are things that frankly most of these big companies should have been doing already and 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 should have that act that they were actively avoiding and i think that the the fact that we've had two years and there was all this pushback is proof you know facebook kind of being publicly forced through, you know, it, the, the terrible press it was getting to not have two option screens, but one is 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 kind of proof of that. Um, I agree with you. I'm just I'm just saying, like, not not to say not to do it. Obviously, you still do it, but I do have questions that, other than some of the the biggest, you know, like American run conglomerates, that you might still have some very big services that will just not respond to this. And and I think that that's just well, something that people should reconcile. So, sure. So the, the thing is, if one of those big companies, let's say, you know, a Chinese company for the sake of argument, if they do business in Europe, if they are big enough or serious enough at this point, they still do have to have some kind of presence uh, in the country. You know, usually you need to have a company that is uh, created in Europe to do business in, with European customers. Uh, uh, you you have you might have employees, you you have someone who's responsible. So if they're big enough the likeliness is that if there's a big problem, there is someone you can point to, go after a company you can find, stuff like that. Yes, there might be a few instances where this doesn't happen, but it's 
it, Actually, that's I an interesting... Right. Christine yeah. raises an interesting question, though. What if you say, no, I'm not going to pay the fine? What do oh, they do? Yeah. Are they going to block you on the internet? No, if you have a, a, a French, this is the reason why. What are they going to do, though? Close uh, your office? What are they going to do? Yes. It's, yeah, absolutely. If you don't pay the fine, then you can, you're can. you liable to criminal, uh, I'm guessing. I'm not a, a lawyer. So but, uh, 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 let's say it's, it's not going to happen. But let's say they said, went after me and said, you're not, Leo, you're not erasing uh, IP addresses of people who uh, download your content. Well, again. And then Leo, I said, well, is, screw you. you. What are they going to do? This is not. You don't have a company in France. Google does. Facebook does. But Amazon, everybody Amazon. who has viewers or listeners or, or readers or, or uh, customers in, in France are s still liable to the EU for those customers, right? Yes. Yes. And in theory, they could go after you. In theory, yes, Leo. Yeah, they I could. know. I'm too small. They're not going to, obviously. And, and, yeah, and, exactly. But... Yeah, I mean, this I guess, I mean, Google's going to pay, or at least they've, they've appealed it, but Google's being fined, what was it, $1.7 billion or something. They're, they'll well, eventually say, pay that. I mean, Maybe or, they or they'll will get it pay. knocked down. Well, because right. this is my question. This is what I'm saying. Speaking of Google specifically, they've been fined multiple times by the EU. To my knowledge, they've paid much smaller fines than than, than what's been, um, you know, issued to them 2. before. 2.7 billion them for years. is the current one. That's the, the, yeah, but but there was there was a Google Shopping thing that I think this might be a separate one. one. That's the shopping one. Yeah. Okay, there was another one too that they they put off. I mean, they've been putting this off for years. So part of me does kind of wonder, like. When are they actually going? I mean, I, I'm not opposed to this law at all. I, as I said, I agree with it. Part of me, though, does wonder like how much of this is bluster and how much of this is just going to carry on in the courts ad nauseum. Listen, how many emails have you gotten of big companies <laughs> right. implementing They're taking laws, it seriously. Right? As oh, they yeah, should because it's the right as thing to should. do. Well, I agree. Yeah. Look, when I first joined Microsoft, not I joined Microsoft a year ago. I was, they were already deep in the GDPR rollout plan. Like it was yeah. already deeply underway. And I'm sure that that's the same way that it's been at every other major yeah. company. This is not something that, that two months ago, people were like, oh, we've got to get on this. This has been a, probably in the works for, for two years at most of these places. I agree. I'm just saying, you know, if people find that there isn't enough being done or if Google were to, or another company were, were to do something that the people claimed violated this, I have no doubt in my mind that there would be an appeal as you know, for, for burning a sort of fine. And, and actually, I mean, I think this is a good thing. I'm just pointing out, I, I think that sometimes we, we say, oh, it's, it's fixed now. And that's not necessarily going to be the case um, because companies will look for ways to still capture what they can. I do have a question because I'm not clear on this. Well, if you ask users to opt into your agreement that says, I will willingly give you this information, can you bypass some of those restrictions? If you are able to get them to agree to a different user agreement that says, it's fine, you can capture my information. Well, I think that's the point. I think you have to explicitly have them agree to giving you this information instead of implicitly doing that. And, and you have right. to give them the right to delete it. They yes, can come to you and say, I will delete my information. And that is the other point I wanted to make. We can argue about whether or not they would comply or not. The fact is they are complying. You yeah, now have the yeah. ability to delete all of your information from all of these networks. Of course, most people are choosing not to do that and are probably going to keep choosing not to do that. But if you want to talk about how, how much teeth that law has and how much weight the EU, you know, ultimately it's all about money. Uh, all of these companies are making a lot of money in EU, in the EU, and they're willing to invest a little bit of uh, money in modifying the, their systems, first of all, because it's, it's ultimately the right thing to do. I think a lot of them are saying now, well, maybe we should be a little bit regulated if it's the right way. Um, and second of all, it's a small investment compared to the money they're making in, in the, the territory. And yes, they could close down their offices in, e, in the EU and have everyone go through Amazon.com or whatever you know US site it is. But in practice, that's just not the way it works. If you want to do business, even in the age of the internet, you need to have a presence in the country or at least in the EU. Um, so it's it's currently working. Now, of course, if they end up having a, a, a fine of 20 million euros or however much it might be 4%, um, they will fight it. It will take years. But that's not even the point. The point is the deterring um, effect is working because they're already doing it. So Doc Searles, who I love and uh, has been on this show, uh, wrote an article I thought was very interesting. Uh, he says one of the side effects of GDPR is it's going to pop the ad tech bubble. Remember that 
Mm -hmm. There are a That's lot of point. companies, Facebook and Google, certainly, that make money by basically collecting information about you and selling it to advertisers. He says, the main problem is tracking people without their knowledge, approval, or a court order is just flat out wrong. The fact that it can be done is no excuse, nor is the monstrous sum of money made by it. He says, without ad tech... That's those, you know, that's basically what this is, is ad tech, the technology's ability to track you and then sell ads against you. The EU's GDPR would never have happened, but the GDR did happen. And as a result, websites all over the world are suddenly <laughs> posting notices about their changed privacy policies, use of cookies and opt-in choices. And uh, email lists are doing it. And he says that's a good thing. Well, Leo, you know this has already happened with clout, right? Yeah, Cloud went out of business. Yep. Hallelujah! Like, wait, a, wait a minute. It's uh, it's going to be how difficult for us to uh, monetize this thing. Did so, they yeah, admit that? Because their last day is May 25th, which is completely huh. coincidentally the day the GDPR goes into effect. I mean, right. No, see, that's the point. Is, is that so the, the, whoever bought Cloud and whoever owns Cloud now said that it just wasn't a, a, no, it wasn't a strategic fit anymore. Yeah. But everyone's you know, know uh, doing the math and being yeah. like, oh, it's funny that that's happening on the day that this new law is coming into effect. Well, but the other, the other example is Unroll Me, which mm -hmm. instead of going out of business just said, well, you know, if you're in the EU, you can't use our service. We we right. need to be right. collecting all that data. Well, I was going to say, I'm this still is, this, using this is, this is, it, I think. Are you? Well, stop. <laughs> I'm, yeah, well, I, I'm going to have to Friday, now. Friday, uh, you have I to stop. Because you recommended it a few years ago. I, I know, and I regret it because, of course, they got caught because really it turned out that Unroll Me, which the idea was you unsubscribe to newsletters for you mm -hmm. and they'll digest them, was selling information, among others, to Uber about you after going through all your, your email. <laughs> Go ahead, Christine. I'm sorry. No, I, no, I, I agree. What I'm saying, though, is this is what's kind of interesting is I, the only thing I would push back on, on Doc's deals a little bit, because I do agree that I think this will definitely impact, especially um, ad tech firms that have like a, a, a European targeting base. But I would not be surprised if some of them or plenty of them are like, okay, well, we're just not going to target these markets uh, because we don't have to and we can still capture a lot of information from, um, you know, Asian and, and uh, US uh, and, 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 you know, uh, South American web visitors. Yeah. Um, now, c conversely, I've been using this month as an opportunity. All these emails... When they come in and I think to myself, I haven't used that service in 10 years. And they say, if you don't log in and and opt in, we're going to have to delete all your... And I'm like, well, great. Yeah. This is a yeah. great opportunity yeah. to prune things back a bit. Yeah. Doc has a really so great... The, uh, Doc, uh, by the way, the author of uh, the Clue Train Manifesto, one of the authors of the Clue Train Manifesto, is not against advertising. He, he actually likes advertising. What he doesn't like is ad tech. And he has all the reasons why ad tech should go away. It's built to undermine the, mind the brand value of all the media it uses. This is interesting. In other words, it's it undermines the content because it cares more about eyeballs than the content itself. And it causes negative associations with brands. He says, not one brand known to the world has been made by ad tech. Ad tech wants to be personal. That's why it's tracking based. Ad tech spies on people and violates their privacies. It's full of fraud. It's a vector for malware. It incentivizes publications to prioritize content generation over journalism. Link bait. Intermediators take most of what's spent anyway of ad tech. Ad tech gives fake news a business model, right? There, there would be no well, fake news if it weren't for ad tech. Okay, but wasn't was it, wasn't Google basically made by DoubleClick? Yeah. I mean, if we're if we're honest, Google's okay, revenue so comes from ad tech. Yeah. Right, I was well, going to say Google's revenue comes and, and, from ad tech. And, right. and, and Google's and right and Google's known to us. I mean, they started as a search engine that was good, but it really didn't start to become everywhere until you had AdSense and that and all that stuff, which... Yeah, but Christina, sorry, click. sorry, I got to do the history thing. Good, internet <laughs> yeah. historians yeah. here. That's why I asked. Yeah. That's why I asked. Um, why AdSense I asked. and AdWords were 2001, 2002. Um, so they don't buy uh, DoubleClick till 2006, I think. So That's actually, right. in, in a way, they don't get the sort of ad tech that Leo is talking about until they've already IPO'd, until they're already this huge company. Right. Okay, and that was, sort of, okay. that was sort of the thing that um, one of the reasons um, a couple years after the IPO that then the stock starts to rise again is because Wall Street was waiting for them. If you think about it, as, as, as genius as the uh, auction model of, of AdWords is, 
it's not very technical on the side of buying ads and placing ads right. because you're just picking keywords and things like that. So Wall Street wanted them desperately to to do this personalized targeting and things like that. And and it's the acquisition of AdWords or not AdWords of uh, DoubleClick that that brought that into their stable. So also Doc no, points they, out thank that thank you for they, correcting me because you're right. I, I I didn't put the the timeline together. I thought DoubleClick was earlier, but you're right. So thank you. Also uh, Doc points out that the, thanks to ad tech, it's the largest boycott in human history. 1.7 billion people use ad blockers. <laughs> just to block ad tech, right? I, I think there's a little bit of wishful thinking in all of this. You know, the the cookies uh, uh, not agreement, but you know, you have to be informed. That didn't do anything, the fact did that it? People just, no. I just it go, did. yeah, yeah, it whatever. Did. Yeah. You just ignore the, it. I think it's, it's, it's the, the saddest thing that these companies didn't do it before because I don't think it's going to change much. Uh, most people, even, you know, myself, I looked at it and I figured, you know, they're going to be displaying ads anyway. Uh, do I want them to be relevant to me or do I want them to be uh, irrelevant to me? Well, there's I mean, one, I'm a there's little bit like thing, you, Leo. I live in public, so. Yeah. One point that Leo just made from reading off the, the Searles thing is, you know, when we're talking, if, if people aren't familiar with this, the, the simplest example is what are we talking about when you're talking about ad tech is it, you go, you, uh, you research hotels in Macon, Georgia. And then the next thing you know, for the next month, everywhere you go, mm -hmm. you're seeing ads for hotels in Macon, Georgia, or the, the thing you looked up on Amazon is suddenly you're seeing it on Facebook. It's when when Searle says that it devalues the content, that's what we mean because what the advertiser cares about is they were able to track that you came and did a search once or you right. came to their website once. And so they don't actually care as opposed to in the old days where if I wanna sell a car, then I would go to a website that has car content and buy right. ads there. They don't care about but that. Now, but They're now chasing that doesn't the matter. eyeball. Right. Wherever right, you right, go, right. they follow you. So he, he points out, I think this is very interesting, that last week Google alerted advertisers it would sharply limit the use of the double-click advertising ID, that Google is already changing how it works because of GDPR. So um, will it pop the bubble or will it make each ad placement cost a little bit more as it should and reward the content what, and what he's the, the right. network better? What he's right about is a lot of, especially the last decade, and I can even say this as someone that's bought a lot of ads as an advertiser, is a lot of the bubble has been specifically that it's called retargeting, where, where you, we can yes. follow you around. Um, but it is that, and then and then you know Facebook came around at the right time when the ability to slice and dice, like we were talking about off air before before we uh, went on air, it like that it has been what has caused the explosion. So if there's a bubble, like obviously we all know that this is it's a gener it's a it's a once in a generation thing. They're standing in the tidal wave of history of all advertising's moving online. We know that. However, it got like steroids injected into it in the last decade by this sort of tech. He he does say Google will be all right because their chief revenue comes from AdWords, the search advertising, which does doesn't need to collect information about you. It's based on what you search for. You're giving well, it a Google signal. Google owns the exchanges. I mean, even if they didn't, Google owns, you know, all, all the sub exchanges and all the, uh, you know, various, you know, uh, networks on networks on networks are all based on Google and Facebook. So right. even if they're not collecting, even if they're not doing this retargeting, they're still the place, they're still the the main network. Like there's not a competitor. Yeah. I mean, and he, by the way, he, he's not against advertising. In fact, he says ad tech. Oh, no, is, I know. I, ad I, I tech's what what's bad about advertising. You know, advertising itself is good. He says, compared to advertising, ad tech is ugly. <laughs> ad tech relies on misdirection. It's, I mean, uh, I, and I agree with him because we do ads, but we don't do ads based on what uh, uh, information we collect about you. We, we do ads based on the content and we know, you know, that our advertisers want to reach tech enthusiasts and that works really well for them. And everybody's happy, right? It's not a, you know, it's, there's a big difference between surveilling you <laughs> and targeting you via the content all right i'm gonna take a break and do an ad how about that how about <laughs> good that? timing hey before i before it's i okay. do uh i want to just ask brian a little bit about uh the uh, the new show because yeah. this, this is great uh tech meme launched a daily news podcast on the tech meme front page everybody here reads tech meme religiously daily and you're right there tell me how that happened uh 
it Gabe had been thinking about doing it for a while. Gabe Rivera, the creator of Tapping. Yes. Yeah. And um, I've been doing podcasting for a while, and we, we've been friends for many years. Um, and, and the thing is, is everybody has a tech podcast. So how are we going to – if we did do a tech meme podcast, how could we possibly compete with the likes of Leo and, and a, a bunch of other great people? And so we thought that what tech meme does well what's – the, what's the use case for it that everyone likes? What did I miss? Yeah. I'll go check tech meme. Yeah. I, I was in a meeting for an hour. What did I miss? Yes. So, so the tech meme right home posts every day, every weekday at 5 p.m. It's about 15 minutes long. And that's the, that's the idea. Like on your way home, guess what? Here's what you missed today in the world of tech. And um, so we, we think that that's uh, it's just extending what tech meme does well uh, into podcast form. Nice. Congratulations. They picked a Thank great host. Thank you so host. much. Yeah. And I was just saying uh, during the last break to uh Carson I like this Brian guy we should have him back <laughs> I hope you'll I hope you'll come by on a regular basis well like, first time long time as they say first time long time <laughs> listening to the show for years yeah and of course Patrick Beja we always love having you on from uh, techspin.com tell me the shows you're doing these days uh frenchspin.com always have to have the french oh uh, I'm sorry there. french spin but yeah. do you have an English uh, language still? Or do you, the Phileas Club, is that still around? Yeah, 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 yeah it is. I do the Phileas Club uh, in English. I do Le Rendez-vous Tech in French. I do Le Rendez-vous Jeu in French as well. Uh, about Your French is excellent, by the way. I just want to congratulate you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It really sounds good. for many years. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I also do uh, Pixels in, in English about gaming as well. Oh, the E3 is, that is coming up. That's going to be fun. Oh, that's uh, I, great. I, basically, when I left Blizzard a few years ago, um, I wanted to talk about gaming in English and, and French, and I launched those two gaming shows. Um, and yeah, and, and the Phileas Club, which I invite a, a few people from different countries, different places in the world, and we talk about what's been happening in the world with different uh, uh angles and and interpretations from different cultures we did uh, a few months a couple of months ago an episode about uh, gun control that was specifically oh, interesting. with american uh, uh uh guests and it was really hard because we did it uh from the point of view of gun owners and gun friendly people and and as we always do we try to do it in a friendly uh uh friendly and and not yelly, I don't know how to describe this, uh, a, a, a civilized debate. And I think we were all surprised at how uh, rational it all ended being. But anyway, so the Phileas Club is one of the interesting ones about uh, uh, difficult topics, but trying to have a, a rational conversation about them. What, do you, what game are you playing these days? I'm not playing Fortnite. I'm apparently... Mm. Why not? That's the greatest <laughs> game ever written. Yeah, it's for the kids. Uh, oh. The kids are playing. No, I I'm, just finished uh, God of War. Heart. God of War is, was, looks really good, yeah. It's pretty good. I got um, Sea of Thieves, I, and I thought, this is terrible. This is... Somebody said <laughs> No Man's Sea. It just <laughs> Basically, it's, it's the criticism being leveled at it by yeah. many, many people. But then I um, hear that No Man's Sky is going to start doing online multiplayer. Yeah, they just announced they're coming to Xbox wow. after the two-year exclusivity on PS4. And they finally are bringing um, uh, multiplayer You might actually run into somebody in the universe. Incredible. I wandered for days. <laughs> I couldn't figure out what is the point of this game. I'm not meeting anybody. I'm not doing anything. Uh, okay. That's it's, why I like it, Fortnite, because at least I can kill somebody. <laughs> And build and build it a, a fort. I like the forts. Um, <laughs> what's do you play on the Switch, Nintendo Switch? You play any games there? Oh, I love my Switch. I yeah. love my Switch. I have every game that comes out, I want it to come out on the Switch because then you can play it portable like, on the go yeah. at home. I notice our fifteen-year-old plays on the big screen too, though he docks it a lot. Yeah, yeah. And has the friends it's over. Uh, He's yeah, bought it's, uh, some more controllers now. And you're a Switch user, right, Christina? I am. I'm a Switch user, and uh, I love it. I, I, I'm like your son. I, I, uh, you're 15 year old. I, I dock it, and I uh, play. You it are a 15 year old boy. I know that actually about you. Yeah. This is true. Yeah. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're, you're not still playing Zelda, though. No, 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 no. Uh, although there's the new one, which I haven't. I don't know if I'm gonna get that one or not. But uh, I like a lot of the indie games, and um, I'm actually I, I'm playing Fortnite a little bit, not as 
not as much as everyone else, but it's, it's hard. Uh, it's, it is, but I like it. It's fun. You know why I like it? Because I get killed right away, but then I can watch the guy who killed me get killed. And then I can watch the guy who killed him get killed. And it's fun. And you get to the really, you get to the end and you see the best player. And it's kind of actually, it's, it's actually, for me, it's a spectator game. <laughs> I like to watch. Oh, no, totally. Like, I think the, the biggest appeal of Fortnite for a lot of people, and, and, and I'm definitely counting myself in this, is the spectator aspect, whether yeah. it's in-game or if it's on Twitch or on YouTube or whatever. I mean, there's just so many amazing players and you just see so many cool things. And then, you know, the mod community is so insane, too. Yeah. So, yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to see. You know, obviously, there's there's the iOS version, which is pretty good, but it'll be interesting to see what happens when uh, the Android version yes, launches. They and said they're coming to Android. Oh. Yep. This this game has been so insane. I mean, last year all we could talk about was uh, Player Unknown's Battleground, and yeah. when when Fortnite pivoted from their co-op campaign to uh, Battle Royale, everyone was thinking, ah, oh, you know, they will. They're cute, but PUBG, PUBG is the big dog here. <laughs> right. And they were free to play on every platform. And I'm telling you, every person I know that interacts with uh, uh, middle schoolers is telling me this is. All they can talk about. Fortnite yep. is their life. Uh, 10 to 13 year old, they 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 live for Fortnite. Not just PUBG, they but uh, Overwatch probably also hurt pretty badly by Fortnite, right? Well, it's not as, uh, so disclaimer, as I said, I used to work for Blizzard, but it's not as much in direct uh, uh, competition with Fortnite. But uh, but certainly now the Battle Royale uh, genre is, yeah. is king. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, to be fair, PUBG is not a free game and Fortnite is, but they're still making money. Hand over I have fist both with and I find that I'm much more interested in Fortnite, partly because it's cartoony. I kind of like it. That's a little it's more less, fun. Yeah, it's more fun. That, I mean, honestly, and I think that's kind of the same thing as why like the Switch has been so popular. There's a certain. I think we almost reached this place with with the you know the the, the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One uh, X and uh, where like the realism is great, but it's kind of fun to have a game look like yeah. a game. It's so funny. So this so Michael, our 15 year old, is playing something. I don't know what it is on the Switch that looks as bad as my Atari 2600. Practically, it's 8 bit. And I say, Michael, you like these games? Yeah, I love these games. He loves the 8 bit. You know, it's like black and red. It's not even colorful. It's all, and he loves it. And I, I think it, is it the gameplay that makes it so good? Same with your kid, uh, Karsten. Is it the gameplay that they like, or do they like the retro? It can't, the retro look can't mean anything to them. They don't remember that. Good games are good games. It's just a good game. Yeah, that shows you after you spend all this energy <laughs> making great <laughs> graphics and high end hardware, and you know he has a fancy Windows Ten machine. He's playing on his Switch on the big screen TV. He's playing some 8-bit game. It's kind of funny. Our show today brought to you by LastPass. This, I almost feel like I should do these ads as a public service announcement. That's how, how important I think LastPass is. 13 million users. I love it. I've been using LastPass since they started. In fact, uh, I, I sold it to, I, I was, you know, selling it, singing his praises as a password vault to Steve Gibson. He said, well, I'm going to look into this because that's how Steve is. He interviewed Joe Segrist, the creator of LastPass. Joe very generously showed him the source code, showed him how it works. And Steve said, this is great. He started using it. That was several years ago. We now use LastPass in the enterprise. So one of the things that happened to us a few years ago, one of our guys, uh, put all the company passwords on a public website <laughs> so he could remember them. And uh, he doesn't work for us anymore. And <laughs> we immediately adopted LastPass Enterprise. Last Look, there's too many passwords to remember. I actually am kind of sympathetic. He couldn't remember all the passwords. But really, if you're, <laughs> you, what you want is a way to keep all those passwords in a super secure encrypted vault you remember one password that lets you unlock the vault, and then it fills in your credentials no matter where you are. It generates strong passwords for you. It makes it easy to change passwords. One of the things I love about LastPass, when there is a breach, I can change the password in an automated fashion quickly. In fact, there's a security check you can run on LastPass, and you can go through and fix all of your passwords. You know, if you've not been using a password vault, you probably have duplicated passwords, things like that. It'll make strong passwords. It'll remember them. It'll fill them in, and not just on your computer, but on your Android device, your iPhone, everywhere you are. A plug in for Chrome, uh, Internet Explorer, Firefox, even Microsoft Edge. It's e I, I trust LastPass so much, I put all my important documents in there, my passport images. That way I have them as I travel. 
my driver's license, my social security numbers, everything's in LastPass. And with LastPass Enterprise, our entire business is protected. In fact, I believe in LastPass so much. Not only do, do we use LastPass Enterprise, but we offer it as a benefit to all our employees, a free LastPass account, because I want them to use it for their personal stuff, not just my stuff, but their personal stuff too. Sensitive data encrypted at the device level with AES 256-bit encryption protects you from man-in-the-middle attacks. Your stuff is safe. Your stuff is secure. It doesn't slow you down. It makes it easy. It is Once you start using LastPass, you'll never go back. Now, they have a number of products. We've got the Enterprise for Business, LastPass Premium for your personal use, LastPass Families for the entire family. By the way, that's great, too, because uh, Lisa and I have to share passwords for, you know, common stuff like our 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 Comcast account, stuff like that. It's the easiest way. I just share it with her. Actually, I have a family fold folder. Everything goes in there. There's LastPass teams for smaller businesses, 50 or less. At work and at home, fix your password woes with LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager. It's got the Steve Gibson seal of approval. Mine, too. LastPass.com slash twit. Try it today. LastPass.com slash twit. See which product is uh, right. Oh, there's a big picture of me on the page. Wow. LastPass. It is, this is actually, that quote is, abs I actually wrote it, it, is literally the first program I install on any new device or computer. First thing I do is put the LastPass plugin on the desktop or the LastPass app, because then all the other apps, which I need to log into, I have LastPass. Makes it much easier. LastPass.com slash twit. We're talking about co countries operating. Oh, actually, before we do uh, go on, I want to go talk a little bit about Apple. But before we go on, I think we should probably show you our little uh, highlight reel from this week on Twit. Previously on Twit. What's up? I'm Jay Bone, also known as Jason Howell, and I am here with the Art of Fawn. The new screensavers. And this is uh, kind of a new approach to uh, MIDI controllers. This, as you can see, is kind of in the shape of a guitar. Mac Break Weekly. Do you like the new Macintosh laptop keyboards? Are you a I, butterfly girl? I, yes, I am. But I know beyond a shadow of doubt, there is something wrong with that keyboard when thousands of people have had issues with it. I really think Apple needs to address this. Triangulation. It was not very long ago. I think it was earlier this month that kind of the greater public learned about the Misty 2. And one of our goals with Misty was to really bring robots to people who aren't roboticists. Windows Weekly. <laughs> Everybody's so excited about the new Surface 2 hub. It actually looks really cool. Yeah, and the way you can so mix four together, they're showing right now with. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's very interesting. Yeah. If you think about a Surface hub as it exists, it's a very expensive enterprise product. I guess I'm being a skeptic on this because I'm like, is it really going to be for a more of a mainstream and more you know, of a business? Barry Joe, I think I speak on behalf of anyone, everyone when I say I'm tired of your negativity. <laughs> <laughs> Twit. It's like tech TV without the overpriced cable bill. That's true. We had a tech TV reunion this week. Uh, we went. We all met in a bar, about 50 of us. Um because it was the 20th anniversary of the launch of Tech TV on May 11th. And it was really nice. I saw everybody was there. It was really fun. In fact, so much fun. I think we're going to do it again in August. We're going to have a barbecue. ZDTV. ZDTV. It was ZDTV first. Amaze yeah, yourself. Yep. That's, that's how I, this, it was my favorite thing to watch. I used to like watch it like from, I remember when it launched and I, I and we got it on Comcast or whatever. And yeah. You like must have been channel. eight years old. I was a little older than that. Not much. I was a little older than that. It was 20 years ago. You were probably 10, I, right? No, no, 11? no. I was. You were young. Hey, Leo. I, I, know you a, I know a tech history podcast that you might need to come back and tell stories on. Oh, I could tell so many stories. Most of them uh, probably shouldn't. <laughs> That's why you just need to go on. You need to go Those on. Those are the on, best uh, ones. Podcast. Yes. I actually went around uh, to several of the young women, no, they were no longer young, the women that were there. I said, I didn't harass you, did I? And they all said, I'm very proud. Oh, no, no of course not. <laughs> I said, I'm trying to remember. Did I harass you? No, 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 no. So you got to check in, right? Every once in a while. I said, every guy when, in the Me Too movement, every guy who worked in broadcasting is trying to, oh, was I okay? Was I creepy? No, I'm glad to say, unless they're lying. But they got nothing to, they got nothing to, no reason to lie now. Was I creepy to you, Christina? No. No. Never. No. That's why you're over there in Seattle 
far, far away. <laughs> Apple uh, is, this is interesting. This comes back to what we were talking about, getting doing business uh, in a country. You have to obey the laws of the country, right? Yeah. Uh, Apple has continuously kind of agreed to do what China's government wants it to do. They took VPNs out of the store last year. Now they're cracking down on apps that use the Call Kit API. This is um, Christine. What is? Do you do you know what Call yeah, Kit does? I do. I do. So basically, you know how um, if you look up someone in your contacts, uh, there's the option for you to call or send them an iMessage. And if you have certain apps installed, like Skype or uh, I guess for a while WeChat or or uh, WhatsApp, and there there are a few others that support it, you can actually make like a WhatsApp call from your contact list. So you don't have to go into WhatsApp, you can just go into your contacts. And so that's uh, that support comes via call kit. Um, and it uses the the, the VoIP protocol uh, to plug into to the contacts map. But I guess in this case, China is saying that we don't want any calls going through, you know, VoIP because- They're encrypted. Uh, exactly. So Apple's way around that is just to say, okay, you're using call kit remove it from your apps or we'll remove apps that are that are using that. I mean, I understand if you want to do business in China, you have to adhere to the laws of China, but I kind of admire Google's principles stand here. They still don't do business in China, right? No, they don't. I mean, but it is becoming very difficult, you know, for, I mean, it's, it's created lots of issues with, with the Google Play. I mean, they, they found some ways around it, but it's become very difficult for Google Play and for Google to even distribute safe apps because people in China aren't using the official store. So, you know, instead you're using, they're using these third party stores that are kind of scraping things and, and that's how, you know, malware gets spread. So uh -huh. there are, are trade-offs and obviously Apple doesn't even have the option. You know, you couldn't even have, there are third party app stores for people who have jailbroken iPhones, but, uh, you know, there isn't an alternative way for people to get apps. So, yeah, I mean, it, I, I, I kind of, I'm kind of with you. I, I, uh, part of me wishes that they could take a more principled stance, but the other part of me, you know, kind of understands that as a business, that's uh, it's not really something where they can uh, say no to one of their uh, biggest uh, revenue generating countries. You know, Apple's, it's easy for Apple to be principled in the United States and say to the right. FBI, we're not going to unlock that phone. Uh, although, I, God, I got in a big fight with a waiter at a, a restaurant the other night who said, Apple should have unlocked that phone. <laughs> and I said, well, but yeah, but if they do, if they have a back door in the stu then you're unsafe. He said, no, no, look, you're supporting terrorists. And so <laughs> Apple has this great principled stand in the United States. And then it, when it's China, it's like, yeah, whatever. Well, I, but I, I do think that there's there's a difference there, right? Like I think that if if China were demanding a backdoor, they're that's gonna different. But they're well, gonna. It and, will. And, and, and I mean, they did that with Yahoo. Remember, they said, "Give yeah. us the information about these dissidents." They arrested the dissidents. It was a, I think, a black but mark. But now on they Yahoo. don't need to anymore. They don't need to but, anymore. They have they have systems in all the inter, uh, intermediate steps. Uh, you know, so all they the won't servers, have to get Apple the, to to to, to yeah, hand over the keys. I don't think so. Potentially, but but I would just, I mean, I would hope, and I I don't know, obviously, I, I I don't work there, and I'm not trying to speak for them, but I would hope that if that if that were something they were coming down, that it wasn't about VPNs, if it wasn't about VoIP protocols, if it wasn't about, um, you know, what the the the, the concessions they'd always made about where they store Chinese users' data, uh, that if it were about something as potentially you know, overreaching as you have to give us a backdoor to the OS, that there would be much more pushback uh, up to and including, you know, pulling out of the market or at least a threat of that. Yeah. I don't I, I don't know for sure, but I feel like there are variations like you can work with 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 countries to to abide by certain things. And then there are certain steps where you can just say, no, I'm not going to do this. And and for Google, you know, um, part of it is that they if they were to abide by um, you know, China's laws and, you know, they would have to change fundamental parts of their business right. and they're not willing to do that. Um, so in but, Google's, but Google's case, it's easy enough to move Google search to Hong Kong. And well, that's the thing. That's the thing. And, and, and they are still having Android licensed phones sold in China. They just don't have the Google play, you know, Google services running. Right. Uh, but they are, it's, it's not as, but you're right. They still have things in Hong Kong and, 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 you know, the, the savvy users are still, um, potentially able to touch into their services, right. um, but it, it, you know, it has created problems for them, and they are, you know, it is going to be an issue they kind of grapple with going forward. Which is, you know, when they you look at, you know, Tencent and Baidu and and some of these other like really really big um, 
Chinese service companies that, you know, Google doesn't have a play in that market. But Google's business and Apple's businesses are very different. I mean, Google's selling data, Apple's primarily selling, you know, hardware. Yeah, and with the VPN thing, they I think they could kind of skate it because you could still use a VPN. You just can't get it in the app store. And so that's not the end of the world, you know, if you're a Chinese dissident or whatever. Uh, I don't, I just, oh, it's, it's unsettling. I agree. I agree. I mean, I, I, I would be curious to know how many Chinese iOS users have accounts, um, like iTunes accounts that they've created in other countries right. in order to get access to you know, different apps because, you know, you can log in with like the, the U S account and then you can log in with the Chinese account and download different apps. Now you've got to log in each time that you want to do an update, but it's relatively easy to just, you know, log out and then log in to another country's account. If you need to download a, a country specific app, or if you need to, you know, get a, get, get an app that's not available in another country. So I would be interested to know how many savvy, you know, um, Chinese iPhone users also have either American or, or European iTunes accounts. Wouldn't the Chinese ISPs block the uh, IPs of the stores? Well, or the, that's the kind of an interesting stores? thing because... They could, but some of them, I mean, it Enforcement is selective. I was yeah. talking to somebody, an expat who lives in China, married a Chinese wife, and uh, he travels a lot. And uh, I, I was asking about the VPN thing. He said, well, you don't want to get caught using a VPN, but they also look... A turn a blind eye to it and a lot of the intelligentsia uses it and they know that you know they're, they're they expect to be able to use that they want access to the internet and, yeah and so I mean, they just turn a blind eye to it on the other hand he he got in trouble uh I've tried, it was a minor thing but he got in trouble and now every time he enters the country he has to be he gets questioned for two or three hours and he has to go present himself when he goes anywhere in china to the local authorities and say i'm here uh, just so you know, I might be spying on you. I'm here, and it, so it's it's a it's an interesting country in that in that regard. I uh, mean, it, it is interesting though, because like for instance, if you have like an American iPhone or whatever, I mean, I've, I've had friends who've gone to, to China. Yes, it, well, I was going to say, and I have friends who um, some of them are like actually Chinese nationals who will go there to you know get their visa renewed or whatever. And will then be communicating <clears throat> with me using Facebook Messenger, which right. is blocked. Shouldn't be. Yeah. It should be blocked, but it's not blocked yet. That's right. how I'm communicating with them. I'm, I'm like, I, and I would even say, do we need to use WeChat? Do we need to use, right. you know, whatever? No, no, no. Messenger's fine. So I, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to pretend to know the intricacies, but I feel like the savvier people, which probably tend to include people who have more monies, which tends to align with people who are iPhone users, have methods of, of getting around some of these things, I would assume. Apple is, interestingly, finally giving Ireland its due. Remember, <laughs> One of the reasons, one of the ways Apple and many companies were able to defer U.S. taxes is by opening essentially shell companies in Ireland and then transferring IP rights to uh, the companies and then paying the companies fees for the use of their technology, thereby getting the money out uh, overseas. Now, of course, with the new tax law, Apple's repatriated a couple of hundred billion dollars. And then the EU goes to Ireland and said, you, you should have been charging Apple tax on this. Apple uh, has been told to, uh, that they that Ireland has to hold 13 billion euros in disputed taxes. Apple has started to pay that. They paid 1.76 billion dollars. I will point out that they have not actually paid it. Oh, it's going a, into an it's, it's going like into an escrow. An escrow right? Oh, it's okay. escrow. It's an escrow account. Yeah, oh, because it's okay. not technically there's still appeals and things like yeah, that. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Now is it earning interest while it's in escrow? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that what escrow is for? I think, right? No, escrow so, I mean, means uh, third party. No, I mean, but escrow is like third yeah. parties just holding it. So that's yeah. what I'm saying. But no, but I bet you don't get interest on there. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't. I think that. Well, I don't know. Well, the other thing well, that I'll point out that would be they, so, they, that could pay for it. You know, during you know the process, they are okay. earning interest because you know who manages it? Golden Goldman Sachs Asset Management. <laughs> 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 They're holding the money and they make low risk investment decisions to protect the Irish taxpayer. This is from Reuters. Uh, did you notice uh, Bloomberg and a bunch of other places had this that um, in the latest, you know, everybody in tech had their quarterly earnings last month or a couple weeks ago. And for years, they all reported the overseas right. uh, money. Right. Yeah. And it's gone. It's gone from Apple. It's gone yep. from Microsoft, Netflix, Alphabet, everybody. 
uh, is no longer because it's not that important to point that out, I guess, anymore. Well, isn't it much of it repatriated? Or are you saying well, it's still there, but they just don't want to talk about it? My understanding is is that like there's no rule saying that they ever had to say what it was. Ah. So the implication is is that by them always reporting that there's all this money they can't touch, that yes. it was like getting shareholders to apply pressure that we need to bring That's that exactly. money home. That's exactly right. That was always the implication, which was uh, we this is money that could be in the United States if only you would relax the tax laws. Right. And now that that's gone, they don't have to mention that. And and in fact, I mean, in some cases it works out well because, you know, um, if there were currency, you know, if the dollar was stronger, for instance, then, you know, all that cash would be worth less. So, you know, um, in, in some cases they would it would be a negative even sometimes kind of a, a applying those things. But, yeah, I think you're exactly right is that, that that's. Now it, it's like, well, who cares? We we got what we wanted and now we can not not talk about that. Yeah. Which, by the way, Europeans aren't super happy that all of that money is gone because yeah. it was made on, oh, on sure European not. citizens. Right. And so I, you were you, you know, the American people or the American no, uh, stockholders. You could blame me. It, it was Leo <laughs> was basically saying, bring the money back. And I want my money. While, we were like, oh, and the shareholders are very second. happy. Because yeah. most of the time, in most cases, this money is being used to to buy back stock, which makes their stock worth more. Mm -hmm. hmm. It's I don't I I guess some of it might be used. Actually, isn't Apple? Uh, aren't they? Didn't they announce a new campus? They're shopping. They're shopping around. So maybe they're, um, they're spending, I think, thirty billion, something like that. Well, they no, they claimed. Well, remember, it was a couple months ago that they said that they were going to spend. I think the number was two hundred billion dollars. Oh wow! And bring, I think the number was twenty thousand jobs to the U.S. And so, the rumors this week, again, I think both of the things I mentioned recently are Mark Gurman scoops. Um, of course, they are. Is that, is that they've been poking around D.C., but mm -hmm. then also um, North Carolina. Right. The what's that? The or no, triangle Virginia, called. Sorry. No, okay, no, no, yeah, it's North yeah. Carolina, research, the research, research North triangle. Carolina, yeah. Yeah. Research yeah. triangle, exactly. Raleigh, yeah. Durham. The yeah. Hill. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And uh, by the way, Tim Cook got his MBA from Duke, so... Yeah. Um, well, and they already that. have the data centers. Well, and, and well, apparently, though, the if I... Again, I, I don't have the article in front of me. Um, the I think that the amount of office space they were looking for, at least in Virginia, was like half of what Amazon was looking for for its entire second... Headquarters. So this is this would be a right. significant um, location if if they do do it. So no, it definitely would because Amazon has. I mean, granted, a lot of Amazon's employees are are in their warehouses and things like that. But I believe Amazon has more you know engineers, corporate employees than Apple does. So if if they're looking at half the number of, of HQ two, which is you know supposed to be a true second headquarters, and that's that's very significant um, considering. You know the number of employees that are typically at non-Cupertino um, Apple campuses. I was my understanding, maybe I'm wrong, that the, that it really it's not a new he a second headquarters for Apple. It's no. probably where no. their call center. No, they is be, right, right. No, they, but they said it was going to be technical support and yeah. something else. So yeah, yeah, it would. But and also this is not the first one because they again the, the size of this would not at all rival what they have in California. But right. the point of the articles I read was it was so significant that, um, you know, the, the states are bending over backwards. Apparently, Cook has met with the um, the governor of Virginia, the governor of North Carolina. So they're almost going. And all of these cities have already sort of put on their best, so their Sunday best for Amazon. So it was very right. easy for them to do the same so thing just, for just, Apple. They're just, flipping, they're just gonna flip, yeah. the, uh, yeah. uh, flip the application. What's interesting though is obviously these cities are bending over backwards, you know, for, for Amazon and, and now Apple. Uh, I live in Seattle, uh, which, you know, has uh, dealing firsthand with some of the good and the bad things that happen when you have, you know, Amazon in your backyard. And it will be interesting to see, you know, sometimes these things, these deals that cities make with these companies, aren't always as beneficial as you would think. And, well, and there's a lot of people- How do people feel about Amazon in Seattle? Because I've heard mixed reports. I mean, they pretty much are kind of in the downtown. They're not like a standalone- Oh yeah, no. No, they are, they own the downtown. Like yeah. the downtown is Amazon. Like the, like the South Lake Union, West Lake Union area is Amazon, period. Is that okay? Um, or is it- It's interesting because I'm sort of biased in that I have a tremendous amount of friends that work there. And like my building, my apartment building, I, 
I would say there are 88 units. I would say 80 of them, um, the, the people in them work at Amazon or Microsoft or wow. Google um, wow. or, or Facebook. Uh, wow. You know, like it's, it's. I would say genuinely like that's probably, the, and the breakdown is you might have a couple people who don't do those things, but but Amazon uh, has a huge workforce in that building, and and uh, you know uh, Microsoft does too. Um, but when I talk to locals, like like a uh, you know Uber drivers or Lyft drivers or people who've been around for a while, their opinion is a lot more negative. And and so I think it, it, for people who are in the tech industry, there's one perspective. For people who aren't, who especially have been in the city for longer, been in the area for longer, I think they kind of blame Amazon on some of the housing issues and some of the the housing crisis. Uh, issues and and you know um, home prices in Seattle uh, area have just exploded and it's you know they're they're you know it's it's what's happened what happened in New York and in San Francisco is is happening in Seattle and and the you know the the growth um, it's just made it really hard for people to um, buy homes let alone you know rents go up too so there's a lot of uh, I think locals who don't like the company and then you kind of have this flip side where a lot of the new people who are coming into the city which obviously are what's making the city kind of boom it's because they're working in tech and, and Amazon is obviously one of the biggest employers. So yeah. it's kind of mixed. Well, as Roland in our chat room said, that's how you got a one hour delivery of a USB-C charger. That is exactly <laughs> how I got a one no, that's, I mean, I'm definitely, that's what I said, like I'm not gonna like speak against it, you know, because I take advantage of it. But but I also can understand, you know, that there was, you know, the city council is, is imposing this tax, for instance, um, on companies saying that if you generate more than a certain amount of revenue, in the city proper, then you have to pay a tax. And it was originally supposed to be, I think, $500 per employee. And they've since settled to $250 per employee. And, yeah. and Amazon's response was to play pretty significant hardball and to say, okay, well, you know, the, these two skyscrapers we're working on, we're just going to abandon them. Wow. And they've since resumed construction on one, and I think they're still in talks to the other. But I mean, it was significant enough that I think the city thought that they kind of had Amazon uh, by the proverbial, you know, um, uh, balls, so to speak. I was trying to think of another short word hairs to use is what we say. Short euphemism. hairs. The short hairs, exactly. That was the better euphemism. Um, but it, they didn't because what ended up happening was Amazon said, okay, fine, we'll stop. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, Amazon they made said, concessions. nice city you have here. It'd be a <laughs> shame if anything were to happen to it. No, totally. Now, and and it, it does create a really conflicting thing for the city because, again, on the one hand, it's not as if Amazon is the only company oh, that wants a, this building. Yeah, there's a Microsoft, I mean, you know, there's Boeing. I mean, Seattle's a big city. Well, not only big. that, but you know, uh, Facebook, uh, you know, has uh, really? has a small campus. Yeah, uh, uh, Google has two different offices, and they're expanding. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's uh, tech Adobe taking, has a pretty. Tech's project. taking over the world. Uh, this Apple is has. I mean, it's, it's small, but <laughs> Apple has has a presence. Yeah. So it's not as if other companies wouldn't want to own this office space, but you know. At the same time, you don't want one of your biggest, you know, landowners to to say we're we're done either. So it's right. they they ended up compromising. But I I would say I feel like the city blinked pretty hard. Like in that well, you know chicken. that's what's happening with Apple. That Tim Cook when he meets with these mayors, he doesn't walk in and says say hey we can't wait to be here. He says what are you, what are you going to do for us? Absolutely. Absolutely. But what but what's interesting is I think what happens, though, is, you know, the cities at first, they look at how great it's going to be. And then you start to realize some of the side effects yeah. if you're not prepared for that. And then if you want to start taxing and start expecting more, that's when it becomes difficult. And that's why I I, I do think that for whatever, you know, either any city looking at, at, at taking on, you know, Apple or, or HQ2 or, or any other tech companies, like you need to look at places like Seattle to kind of see like, this is what happens when, uh, when you kind of give them the world. Now, con conversely, uh, there was an article last week, I did a segment on, I think it was Wall Street Journal, that all of these cities, specifically, they mentioned Cincinnati, all these cities, they uh, dress up for Amazon. Amazon comes to town. Amazon says no, but yep. then they they give you the reasons why you say no. And all of these cities are implementing the They're changes. Fixing it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Amazon gave us some notes, and we're gonna re we're gonna we're gonna fix this city up. <laughs> well, I guess you know tax base, right? I gotta. Yeah. I want to take a break uh, because I have to have some wine, but I. Uh, <laughs> But I w I'm wondering now, somebody said something in the chat room that kind of got me thinking. Uh, he said, uh, this isn't tech. These are big companies. They just use tech to make money. Mm. Are big companies bad for tech? Have 
have have the big companies taken over tech and is that hurting us is that hurting innovation is it it's an interesting question let's take a break and talk about it because i have a uh, a little delivery i've got to open up here my monthly my monthly oh it even made a sound my month, <laughs> <laughs> my monthly wink is here i love the wink wine uh, it is a really great idea. If you go to W-I-N-C, actually it's try, T-R-Y, W-I-N-C dot com, slash twit, you can go through their taste questionnaire to figure out what kind of wine you would like. They ask you about things like, do you like, how do you like your coffee? Do you like salt? Do you like mushrooms? Do you like citrus? And then the taste profile, they'll build you your first wink delivery. You get to choose all white, all red, a split. You get to actually, if you don't like a wine, you can replace it as well. But Wink is neat. Wink is not, um, it's a wine club, but they're the winemaker. That's really important. They're not, you know, reselling old wine from some company that couldn't sell it. Ooh, it makes such a nice sound when I open it up. They are making the wine, and they make some amazing wine. Here's uh, something from New Zealand. Outer Sounds, a beautiful Sauvignon Blanc. I love it when my delivery comes. This is, uh, look at the labels too. They're great. V. Bass, a Merlot from Paydoc, a French Merlot. Actually, I'm going to see, you know, what I usually do, we, we go through about a, a bottle a week. You know, you have it with a nice dinner and uh, maybe, 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 maybe three bottles a month. And then we always have one and I always decide when I open the box, oh, this is the one, Folly of the Beast, a Pinot, probably from the Central Coast. Yeah. So I always look, oh, this is the one that I'm going to bring when we uh, go to visit people. You know, it's nice to bring a little bottle of wine. And we actually did that last night. And it's nice. You have a little something to give. So do the quiz. They work with the best winemakers and growers from around the world to make this wine. Each month there are new delicious wines. Uh, summertime's coming. you got to try the Summer Water Rosé. It's amazingly refreshing. And frankly, this is my favorite. We always get at least one bottle of this. It's the Field Theory Blau Frankisch. Uh, it's a Paso Robles, so it's also Central Coast. This is the most delicious wine I have ever had. And I love the bottle. It's kind of a cool, almost looks like a whiskey bottle instead of a regular wine bottle. And the label's painted on. This is, I think this is the wine that they pick the grapes at midnight. They pick them in the dark because they don't want the hot sun. They don't want the grapes to warm up when they're picking them. They also partner with uh, local artists to make these beautiful labels. Each bottle a work of art. Each bottle great wine at a great price. Shipping is covered. If you don't like a bottle, if you say, ah, yeah, that wasn't so good, don't, no questions asked. They'll just replace it with a bottle you love. You don't have to send the other one back. Sit back, relax, and celebrate with Wink. Don't get, you know, I think a lot of us get in wine ruts. This is a great way to try new wines, find new flavors, and that you're guaranteed to like. Why settle for the same bottle of wine you always get? Discover great wine today at trywink.com slash twit and get $20 off your first shipment. T-R-Y-W-I-N-C. See, get it, wine club. W-I-N-C dot com slash twit. $20 off trywink.com slash twit. Twit. Now all we need is glasses and a corkscrew, mm -hmm. and we can continue <laughs> continue on with the show. Uh, what do you think? Am I? That is an interesting point of view. Uh, do we need the big companies, or do they really not help? But do they get in the way of innovation and tech? I think well, that for some of the bigger problems that we solve, like artificial intelligence, like machine learning. Um, like robotics, um, I do think that you probably do need the bigger companies only because you need the the money to be able to fund research and development. You agree, guys? Well, that's one of the problems for the two big areas of growth that we have for the future, uh, AI, machine learning, all of this, and VR, you need to be to have well the data on one hand and the r d and all of that on the other hand and it's really difficult for a small company to get in that game um and especially when the big companies are buying all of the up-and-comers and sort of taking them for themselves i'm wondering if like many others are wondering if we haven't reached a point where they are a little bit too big and 
there you know the thing in tech is that there can always be a new comer that changes everything but the new things are now those areas where there the, the the old comers are already uh snagging everything there is to snag so i don't you know it's the first time in in the 20 or 30 years i've liked tech where i'm wondering if there can be a change or if they're really just those behemoths are I mean, have they ever been this large? No. Has any company ever been well, this large? And my my sure. problem is that I think that they stifle innovation ultimately. I mean, you see well, things like Google, and I, I know Microsoft does this too, really trying to preserve that small company point of view within the big company because they know that's where innovation happens. Yes, definitely. you need resources, but it's the guy in the garage or gal in the garage, even in things like robotics and AI, that often makes the big breakthrough that then can be leveraged by a big um, company. Again, forgive me for putting on history hat here. Please uh, do. No, that's why you're here. But but but, but what we've never had, and, and, and it depends on your definition of what technology industry we're talking about, um, you know, what we've never had in previous eras, there was always one big company that everyone was afraid of. So it was IBM for a while, then it was Microsoft for a while. We've never had in at least computing and again, this is debatable going back to the Traders 8 and all the companies that came out of that and, and stuff like that. But so now you have essentially these big four dominant. So you have an oligopoly as opposed to. So if there's only one target, if everyone if, I'm sorry, Christina, going back to a different no, era, fine. if everyone if everyone hates Microsoft and is gunning fine. for Microsoft, that's a different ecosystem than there's a club at the top. And right. and. It's, it would seem to me that it would be much, much harder to break into a club than to kill off the giant if there's only one giant. I agree with that 100%. Uh, um, but I would say I think that it is, uh, and you're the history expert, so I, I would like your perspective on this. I don't think it's necessarily fair to say we've never had anything as big as this because I do think we've had companies that have been equally as powerful. I think the difference, as you say, is now there are multiple, right? So right. You might that's, be able that's to the point I'm making. That's okay. what the point I'm making is that so IBM, no one will ever be as dominant as IBM was through the early 80s, right? In in, te in, in right. computing, not in not in consumer electronics or anything like that. Uh, and then a similar argument can be made for Microsoft in software. But this is my point is that those were always one giant. And so all of the little Davids were running around nipping at their heels. But what happens when there's a club, when there is an oligopoly? And so that even though Microsoft is competing with Google, is competing with Apple, is competing with Google, like it, I, but at the same time, it, it would seem to me that it would be easier to close the gate behind you if you're in that club. Yeah, who would and, want to start a search a search engine these days? Yeah. Who would want to write another operating system these days? Who would want to create a social network these days? Those guys well, are dominant. Well, they have a lock. Well, you're right. But at the same time, I mean, who would have predicted that WhatsApp would become, you know, would, would sell for, for, for $19.2 billion? But this is what we're saying. Christina, well, this Zuckerberg, is exactly what we're saying. Because point. as soon Zuckerberg. as WhatsApp comes around, it's gone. No, yeah. you're not wrong. Z Zuckerberg but, 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 buys but, but, up. And of course. But I do think that that's a. I mean, but but all I'm saying though is I do think that's proof that you can disrupt whether they get acquired by someone else or not. And if we want to talk about should should companies be split up or not, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think you can make the argument that you know AT and T was split up, and ultimately nothing changed, and then it just reformed. Yeah, I don't you know, think it, splitting it, it, it up is the right answer. No, I, and I think but, true technologists believe that they'll be split up by innovation. In yeah, and I think that's probably yes, true. Possibly. But but the, the even the WhatsApp thing, let's say WhatsApp doesn't get acquired. And I mean, WhatsApp is cute, but it's not disrupting Apple, Amazon, and Facebook. It's some... Oh, maybe in fact, in you could say the reason Facebook it, acquired them is precisely so it wouldn't. Same thing with Instagram, no, right? right? But I, let's imagine <laughs> it didn't. Let's imagine it didn't. And I look what look at the company they couldn't no. get, which was Snap. Right. Yeah. So yeah. is Snap okay. uh, is Snap a threat anymore? No. no. Well, but I don't and think Snap was ever thing, a threat. The other thing is, the other thing is, unlike what's been happening in the past thirty or fifty years, uh, tech doesn't mean the same thing anymore, right? That's As you true. were saying, Brian, IBM was hardware, uh, Microsoft was software. Today, tech is everything. Yeah, uh, it's cars, what, it's social networks. Amazon right, yeah. does. Look at what Apple does. Look at even what Facebook does, and they're you know. 
it's it it's in every single thing. Why were publishers pissed off in Europe and actually in the U.S. I'm sure as well. Why why are uh, uh, taxi drivers pissed off? Oh, yeah. because of yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Well, I mean, well, tech well, is well, not, Uber's a great example though. Like because if you think about, it, I mean, granted, we don't know what the final story on Uber is going to be, but Uber has disrupted significant industries, and it has done it. You know, and like I mean. It, it was able to get significant funding. Now, I think that's the key, right, is that it, it got significant institutional funding. I agree with yeah. that, what you're all saying, but I, I feel like I'm not going to say that I don't think there's any way that others can innovate. Do I think it's extremely difficult? Without a doubt. The bar is so much higher than it's ever been. But if you have a it, it but the right, you know, um, stars aligning and with the right institutional funding, I do feel like there would be the potential for someone to be what Google was you know, there's a hundred percent. There always ago. will be the there always will be put the potential to that. The, the, I guess the argument that I'm making by this idea of a club and an oligopoly is like it's in the it's in the rundown. Um, Apple and Samsung are having their trial, right? Yeah, right. Monday. So that, Monday, we're going to hear the results. I exactly. Think. But yeah. so, but they don't they don't stop doing business with each other. Meanwhile, in the old uh, olden timey days, you had a company like uh, Netscape come around and they wanted to give. Microsoft the middle finger very clearly because they you know what I mean so if you're in a club yeah, but remember what happened to Netscape fact, well that's true so I have a vivid <laughs> vivid memory of this because when Internet Explorer 3 came out this was in 1990 I want to say four or five I went on uh, TV on NBC and said you might as well close the doors at Netscape because Microsoft's giving away a good browser. It's all over for well, Netscape. Well, it was better. I mean, it not a better browser, free, it was not better. just good, better. It was better. And my somebody told me later that Mark Andreessen had the TV on. And he heard me say this, and he went screaming down the, "Who is his ass?" You know. <laughs> but I was. I think I was right. You're right. Uh, David doesn't always kill Goliath, but what I'm saying is, is it's much harder if there's six Goliaths and they're in a club yeah. and they'll and they'll have their disagreements and they'll sue each other, but you're, then they'll also right. do business. But there's a reason why David and, the David and Goliath is is a story we remember because that's it's mm -hmm. the exception, right? Well, this is I'm going to borrow thing. your Brian. Let me borrow your history hat for a moment sure, because please. here's an article from Dig that I love. Huh. <laughs> this is a great article, a uh, little history. The largest company of all time is not any of the companies you might think of. It Absolutely. was the 1637, 1637, the Dutch East India Company. Uh, if you adjust for inflation, it was worth $7.9 trillion. Trillion! We're talking about how Apple might hit a trillion later this year. These are the 20 tech companies that combine to make the one Dutch East India Company. So now that's an exception. Obviously, that was a blip, and it wasn't worth seven point nine million and a trillion a few years later. But, but, but I think that does kind of point out though that like the historically we have had these huge conglomerates, and we've even had if you look at like obviously we we view things. I think uh, most of us through through a Western lens. I mean, uh, you know, uh, three of us on this panel are from the United States, and um, we also have our, our our French compatriot. But if you like, if you look at like Korea, yeah. for instance, you know, their Shibal system, where Samsung, I think it's important to note thirty I mean, percent of the GNP. Yes, and 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 but not but Samsung is is not just the electronics company there, they run the hospitals, they run the insurance companies, they run the manufacturings, they make, yep. I mean, they're involved in, in clothing. I mean, they were literally involved in every single industry. It is not just Samsung Electronics is the most, you know, well known and the most profitable, but it is far from the only part of that business. And so, and and that was the same thing with the West, with, with, with the with the uh, the, the uh, West Indies uh, uh, trade company. Like it was this huge touched into everything. And I think that's kind of what was going to be said earlier is that tech is no longer just one thing. It kind of goes into everything. And by extension, it means that if that if you do have a club, it is going to be harder for anybody else to to get in. But but it's not, but, the, my, I guess my question was really about what we should cover is, is are, are we now just covering business because we're covering big companies? <laughs> just they happen to be in kind of in the business Hasn't of it always tech. been the case, though? I mean, no, no, always, no, I mean, no, because look at the top um, buy market cap companies in the world right now. And what is it like seven of the 10 are all tech? Yeah. And look at even five years ago, that wasn't the case. But I could tell you when tech TV started, there were a lot, there was a lot of little stuff to cover, a lot of interesting yeah. innovations to cover. It's only kind of lately that it's become these dominant giant companies. I, I find that less interesting. For I mean, it's I interesting mean, in other ways. There's the philosophy that we were talking about at the beginning of the show. 
Well, I mean, but 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 I mean, and I, I agree with you. But I, I think do you, do you think that maybe part of it is that until we kind of maybe reach this this next big technological breakthrough, we're trying to solve really big problems. And so right. whether it's it's one big company or six, right. you have to be big to be able to solve those problems. And potentially once we reach that next breakthrough, maybe then it'll be the next time for. The, the upstarts, the startups, the smaller places to come in and innovate. But it's almost like the, the big challenges that we have to achieve now require, for better or worse, a tremendous amount of money, a tremendous amount of talent. And you just don't get that um, un unless you're gigantic, unfortunately. You guys know what a stingray is. I'm not talking about a fish. I'm talking about a device that... Uh impersonates a cell phone tower, captures your cell phone traffic, and as a result can intercept your calls. The Washington, D.C. NBC affiliate, Channel 4, drove around the D.C. area with uh, a mobile security expert and some hardware and software. They were able to detect in the D.C. area 40 Stingray devices that, that were being used, presumably, to intercept calls by members of Congress, the Department of Homeland Security, President Trump. Uh, he said, uh, we got picked up twice while driving along K Street, the lobbyist corridor, uh, <laughs> and then they drop them. So you could actually see the Stingray pick up the call, examine the traffic, and then pass it off and say, yeah, you're not interesting. Um, I know there's nothing to say about this except, <laughs> wow, <laughs> four. The dark night, the, the the dark night was right, right? Yeah. Like. Don't drive around Washington D.C. if you want to be private. Well, but are those legal? Are those like? Well, they're legal if I'm, law enforcement uses them. I don't imagine it's law enforcement. Right. We we don't know. Uh, I mean, maybe it, they're all being used by law enforcement, but uh, well, maybe they're being used. Maybe like embassies. You know, you go down mm. Embassy Row. There's a ton of them. <laughs> <laughs> Just think it's. By the way, uh, the uh, the longest connection that the Channel Four team had was uh, next to the Russian embassy. The phones appeared to remain connected to a fake tower. The longest. Oh, and the Chinese and Israeli embassies, and then uh, the Romanian and uh, Turkish embassies. Apparently, they're all running stingrays. And by the way, here's the quote from the security expert. You know, governments do this to each other all the time, and laws schmaws. <laughs> laws schmaws. Uh, take a, we'll take a quick break. we got to wrap it up. It's, this has been going on for a long time. we got to go, what is it, the Billboard Music Awards or something? Lisa said, "Come home early. We got so we got a show to watch. Our show. If you get a chance to go see Pink, I don't know if she's coming up your way, Christina. Do okay. I saw. We, I'm gonna see. Is she good? It was it good? Friday night we saw her. It was amazing. Great show. She flies through. At the end, the best grand finale I've ever seen in a concert. They put her in a harness and she flies all over the stadium, sings to every part of it. She goes up to the balcony. She's just flying around singing. Love it. <laughs> she's awesome. I'm seeing." No, she's great. No, I always love her her um her aerobatic stuff. Oh um, man, it's I'm, I'm Teen Taylor. Sw I've never seen. You're seeing Tay Tay. Really want to. You going to the foundation I'm tour? Her on I'm I'm oh. going on Tuesday. Got floor seats. <clears throat> Whoa, you got to tell us all about it. I, I'm very excited. Oh, I'm sorry. I know what I have to go home for. Basketball. Warriors are playing tonight. Our show today brought to you by Rocket Mortgage. Actually, Quicken Loans, the the creators of Rocket Mortgage. Did, aren't they, isn't it the Quicken Loans Arena in uh, Cleveland? And Dan Harmon, of course, the founder of Quicken Loans, has done amazing things to revitalize downtown Detroit. It's a really cool company. The number one lender in the country, number one in customer satisfaction, eight years in a row, according to J.D. Power. And they realized that geeks weren't being well served by the mortgage system. You know, you have to go to a bank. You go, please, going to have some money. Put on a tie or a dress. It's just no fun. Then you have to go to the attic and find pay stubs and bank statements. And it takes a long time, weeks. The last house Lisa and I bought, when we bought our house three or four years ago, took two months to get a loan. We almost lost the house. Fast forward to the 21st century and Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans, an entirely online loan approval process. You could do the whole thing on your phone. You could do it so fast you could do it in an open house and say, we're approved before you leave. That's how easy it is. Go right now, actually. Set up the account, rocketmortgage.com slash twit2, twit in the number two. 
Uh, set up an account. You don't have to go to the attic to find anything. You just answer a few questions, things you already know, birth date, address, things like that. You give them permission because they have trusted relationships with all the financial institutions. You go give them permission to go get out, get the financial information they need. Then they crunch the numbers based on income, assets, and credit. In most cases, within 10 minutes, you'll get loan approval. They can analyze all the home loan options for which you qualify. You choose the term, the rate, the down payment. Very good rates. You'll find the one that's just right for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. You'll apply simply. You'll understand fully. You'll mortgage confidently. And best of all, it takes no time at all. And no rummaging. No rummaging. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash twit and the number two equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states and mlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. I want to make that their slogan. No rummaging necessary. Rocketmortgage.com slash twit two. Christina Warren was rummaging around for a type C cable. <laughs> Destroyed her office. Rummaging can be did. very bad. I'm glad you. You uh, should see it. It's a disaster zone. <laughs> it like it really is. <laughs> like I have to. I had to go to my 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 work office because my home office is like, yeah. Did you? I just. I imagine you like throwing things in the air. Yes, and going through boxes and trying to find it, and then and then after it arrived, I finally found where it was. Oh. It was in a suitcase someplace, and I was like, oh, oh. of course, of course. Uh, we talked on security now about e fail. Uh, a flaw, not in PGP and SMIME, but it, it, it has that impact of breaking PGP and SMIME. If you're using a mail client that supports HTML mail, uh, patches are being worked on as we speak. This is a big deal. Actually, the problem eFail was found some months ago. I know because I got an email from MailMate, which is uh, the Mac program I use. And he said, I couldn't say anything about it, but the last update, the update we put out in March, specifically addressed this and we fixed it. But at the time, I couldn't, you know, they had told us ahead of time we patched as fast as we could, but I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to tell anybody else that this thing existed. So check with your email client. Make sure it's up to date. If you want to use PGP or SMIME for security or signing, you should. Um, do you care about Yanni and Laurel? <laughs> do you care? I was wondering if I was wondering if you were going to do this. I did not want to do it. I honestly. Right. <laughs> it's, it, it's the audio version of the dress, and and we all lost interest twice as fast. Yeah, is that funny? Created by high school students. Well, wait. Let me. Okay, I don't know if anyone knows this, but like, so there are two competing high schools or high school student groups. Uh, so one, the New York Times has an article that says it's these one teenagers. They were in a class that, uh, what is it, vocabulary.com, and then it went to Reddit, then it went to YouTube. But then Wired's piece were different teenagers, but it was the exact same story. <laughs> what? So I don't know, I don't know okay, if that has ever been solved. Right. That, See, that is the okay, part now, of the story that I okay, care about. Okay, I was going to say, I'm into that. That I care about. I don't care about the other stuff. That I care about. I want the drama. Who Who's actually responsible <laughs> and who's the imposter? That's that's the real story. Right, because Wired's story is the true story of Yanni versus Laurel. And the New York Times was – but it's it's different people. So I, I, I want to find out in the end who who's the, the true origin story here. Do you care which one Yanni hears? No. It's all it's all about your ears and what, what register you Here's hear. Yanni and his Yanni. He hears Yanni. Of course he hears Yanni. <laughs> <laughs> I should play it. Let me just play it. What? No? Laurel. Oh, I heard Laurel. Oh, I just heard both. Laurel. No, I was now gonna say I've Laurel. heard I've heard Yanni this entire time and now I hear Laurel. So yeah, me too. Me too. I think it's probably the the Skype algorithm that that yeah. distorts it enough that we're hearing. When Laurel. I when I exactly. did the episode, I recorded that exact clip, and all the time in my headphones, I heard Laurel, Laurel, Laurel. When I listened to it back, the episode on my AirPods, uh, I heard Yanni for the first time. So we did an experiment. I think this actually uh, was why I thought I'm this is dumb, because the because Yanni is recorded at high as the higher pitch, and and Laurel's at the lower pitch. And, and it depended on the speaker you played it through. So when we played it through tinny yep. speakers, you heard Danny. When you played it through bassy speakers, you heard Laurel. Yeah. I, I, now that I think about it, I, I think I'd only heard it before, like, actually on the audio on my phone, like yeah. my phone speaker. So you're going to hear Yanny. Whereas, 
Yeah. And and now I've got like the, you know, the good headphones. The, yeah. Exactly. Like my, my standard Sony, you know, headphones that are, are the Yep. Laurel. Wow. <laughs> Chat room saying I caved. <laughs> I wasn't going to do it. Honest. Anybody excited no, about the, the new red phone, the Hydrogen One? They've they've started to make uh, some announcements. They're showing it to people. We're gonna. I think we're gonna get one up here for a for a hands on. It's expensive. I think twelve hundred dollars. But the key is these pogo pins you see at the bottom. Uh, red, which of course is best known for its amazing five, four, and five K cameras, say uh, they're gonna make cameras and other accessories uh, for this phone. I'm not so excited about the 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 holographic display. Yeah, that I don't care about. But if you could have a really good like accessory ecosystem for that, yeah. where it would, where you could, especially if there's like an adapter, so it could work with maybe some of the existing red stuff Ooh. or the lenses anyway, like that would be amazing. Ooh. Well, I mean, I'm guessing the uh, the the target market for this is very limited. But what's the holographic screen and and uh, I think it's lin camera lenticular 3D. It'd be my guess. You know where it's, oh. it's like those dopey. It's, it's you know. like the fire well, that's phone. That's disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the fire phone. In fact, I think it's exactly that. But, but but who knows? I don't know. I haven't seen it yet. It is. You can get if you're really crazy a titanium model for sixteen hundred bucks. Okay. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I think well, it's well, not I mean, I guess be if you were going to have it everyone. on a rig all the time, if you're going to have it connected, yeah. you know, to, to a bunch of heavy equipment and and other expensive things, maybe I don't. I don't know. Here's the thing I, that I, might I, be a little you, disappointing. If you have heavy equipment. Here's the thing. Why not? Yeah. Here's the thing that might be a little disappointing to people is that while some really interesting foes like the Honor and uh, the Huawei and uh, are, are having trouble getting U.S. carriers, both Verizon and AT and T are carrying this phone. Seriously. Yeah. I want. That's I mean, I want to try the P9. I want to. You know. I mean, I, it's. I feel like. Come on, guys. Uh, the Mickey Mouse copyright law. Yeah. <laughs> It, it comes up every few years. Whenever Mickey Mouse's copyright is about to lapse. Yeah, Disney is like, nope. Not going to happen. Every year it gets extended. The U.S. Congress is now considering extending copyright to 144 years. Thanks, so Steve where would Willie. that bring us? I, I don't know. Mickey Mouse came out in, what, 1927? Go back, yeah, to that so chart. We'll go back to that chart, Leo, because it... Uh, all right, so it's got to come up in 2023. So that's well, uh, they'll have to pass this yeah. bill in the next few years. I can't do the math that quickly. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I think Mickey Mouse was 1923. They've been extending right. it ever since 1923. Originally, I think it was the life of the uh, creator. Then it became the life plus 10. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it became uh, as long as Disney wants to do it. It was called, no accident, the Sonny Bono Copyright Act. Yes, no, because that, I mean, that was his whole, I mean, because he was very much in favor of that because he wanted all of his things yeah. protected when he was a congressman. So it was uh, in the uh, the founders during the, uh, in the early days, the 1790 Copyright Act, it was 27 years. Then for a long time, it was 40 some years. When Mickey Mouse was created in 1928, at that time, it was 55 years. Then in 79, it was expanded. 98, it was expanded. 2023, and... So that's when we're going to have to come on, guys. Can, and didn't, and I guess if it was 98, if, they must if, have named it after Sony Bono died. Oh, maybe. Uh, but, but, but like, I, I, so I think that's it was named in like his honor. But I think he'd fought yeah, to yeah. Oh, yeah. spin those things. But oh, I think yeah. it was after he'd uh, he was in his accidents that I, I think that's why it was named after him. Does yeah. anybody care that the Senate voted to uh, extend net neutrality? It has well, no no we'll hope care in the house. when it passes the House. Right? Yeah, and even if it passed the House. It's got to be signed into law by the president, who's surely. I think not if it going. passed the house, he would sign because I don't think he cares. He doesn't care. I think that I, I think if he could be convinced that it would be a win for him, he would sign right. it. Like I, but but I think I don't think it's going to pass the house. But I do think that if it passed the house, he would absolutely sign it and then well, try to make it look like he's done something. Then important. I'm going to give you all homework. Mm. Call your member of Congress. <laughs> I will. I promise. Oh wait. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Patrick. My, my my state has already passed its own net neutrality thing. I to know. Say so that, is mine. And my city. Yeah. Well, my my state and my city. So like, even if like Wash, I mean Washington State came through, but even if they hadn't, like Seattle proper, like last year was like no. I wonder. Sorry, though, we're not giving anything over. <clears throat> this will be an interesting court battle. 
Oh, it will. I mean, that's <clears throat> going to ultimately be the interesting thing is, is, is the that will be a, like a Supreme Court, you know, sort of case if, if you know, the, the um, FCC can over uh, state, you know, uh, states provisions that will that would actually be really interesting. But hopefully by that point, this whole thing will be moot. But somebody said if you just had Obama come out against it, then uh, <laughs> Trump would. Yeah. Go, yeah, I'm all for it. Uh, here's the final story. We're all podcasters here, right? You've got the Internet History Podcast, the Tech the tech, uh, tech Memes Daily Ride Home Ride Podcast. Home. Yeah, sorry. Christina's got that fabulous show she does with Simone de Rochefort and uh, and uh, Brianna Wu called... Rocket. Rocket. Patrick's got French and English podcasts. Good news. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Personal yeah. audio, which... We got a dunning notice from them. They wanted millions of dollars from us because they said they had patented podcasting. They, uh, the EFF, bless you, EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, did an inter partes motion, got the the trademark uh, and patent office to overturn it uh, in 2013. It was uh, then appealed by Personal Audio all the way up to the Supreme Court. As of May 14th, the Supreme Court has rejected personal audios petition for review unless the eu wants to take this on there is no higher court it's over <laughs> we you save podcasting everybody thanks to people like adam carolla too who actually went to court we were prepared to go to court uh we when they asked us for i think two and a half million something like that we said no and then we never heard from them again so <laughs> thank god because it would have been expensive they made a mistake, though, because it wouldn't cost us that much to defend it. You're, just a tip to right. future patent trolls, always ask less than the cost of defending it. So if it's a million dollars to defend it, which is about what it would have cost us probably, ask for 9.8. You know, 980,000. His and, new podcast is called Extortion 101. <laughs> <laughs> How to be a good patent troll. This week in extortion. I like that. This yeah, week there in you extortion. Go. Twice. Thank you so much, Christina, for being with us. I really appreciate it. You came all the way to work just so you could be here. Senior Cloud. I did. I loved it. Oh, we love having you on. You're the greatest. Senior Cloud Dev Advocate at Microsoft. Film Girl on the Twitter. Film underscore Girl. Catcher on Rocket. What else do you, what other things? You, you're on Channel 9, right? Yeah. So, and, and that's actually, we've got a, a new YouTube channel. It's a youtube.com slash Microsoft developer. And that's where all of our developer content is. It's where all the sessions from Build are. And we're also doing other shows. There's a really fun show called Five Things um, with the, that some of our CDAs do where they very briefly teach you five things about a different type of web uh, language or, or um, cool cloud. Hey, guys, and uh, welcome to. Oh, that's you. That's me. Yeah, when you go to you go there, you literally, I'm right that's, there. That's you. Uh, that nice. is me. Uh, yeah, no. So uh, that that's um, Channel Nine. Obviously, still has its main, you know, uh, website, but we're we're also putting all the stuff. I'm glad on, you're uh, on YouTube. This YouTube. makes it very easy to find. And, yeah, that's uh, the goal. Yeah. So we know that's where everybody is, and so it didn't make sense for us to to not be there. And so we're, we've got it both places. So if you're in a country that doesn't have YouTube or corporate policy or whatever, we still are not on YouTube as well. But we're we're trying to put everything that way. And um, if you have a ideas for types of contents, you know, developer content that you want to see. And, you know, we do non Microsoft centric stuff all the time. You know, so people are focused on, on, on Python or, or, or web or, you know, any of those things um, we care about. So like, let, let me know and, and um, we can see what types of shows we, we can get created and who we can talk to. So I love it that you've got every, every uh, talk from a uh, build on there. That's really, really great. Um, and I love it that you're the face of it. You really are, yeah. aren't you? You're like the star yes, of the show. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the big part of my job is to kind of, uh, you know, lead a lot of the strategy around that and to do interviews with people and, to, you know, host at events and stuff like that. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of what I do. They are so smart. What a good move from Microsoft. Thank you, Christina. Thank great, you, Leo. Great to see you. Thank you, Patrick Beja. Don't forget Frenchspin.com, the Phileas Club. Uh, all the stuff he does in French. It's all there. I want to listen to Pixels. That's a, also English language. I'm a, I'm very interested. Yeah, we're going to have an interesting one for E3. And uh, I guess the French ones, Leo. Do you want to learn French? I should Do listen. You want to speak French? I speak a little. You know, I studied in four years in high school. I should. I could listen, and it would it would build my French, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, that's the thing because it's. I mean, Rendezvous Tech is the one I'm talking about now. Um, 
it's about tech. Yeah. So you already know basically half the words. I know. Um, do you, now, wait a minute. Do you call it a computer or an ordinateur? Uh, we do ordinateur, but it's probably one of the last uh, <laughs> words that were actually it's, translated it into so French. Antique. And it's very weird. It's an ordinateur. It's, it sounds weird <laughs> because they it actually to uh, ordiner is, well, I guess it's the same in English. You you order right. numbers, right? Right. And that's what basically a, a computer does. So the, the French, the Académie Française translated it. But today, we don't translate any of those anymore. anymore. I mean. Sometimes yeah. we do, but the, they have already come into the language because the internet makes all this instantaneous. So we say a smartphone. We don't really say a, a like a, a intelligent telephone or something you like that. You don't call it a, um, a handy or something like that? No, no, we don't. And I guess some people, they, they try to do it for email. Uh, there are specific oh, words yes. for, for yes. stuff like that, but no one really uses so them. Does, so, is, uh, so is it over for the Académie Française that they are not going to... Oh, no, it's not. They, they try. Um, and I guess they <laughs> succeed to an extent. But uh, it, it, the, the, the communication is so It's too fast. They can't nowadays. keep up. Yeah. 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 It's, it's uh, you know, they're, what are they going to do? Like, uh, they, they're going to try to find a French words for, for a snap? The, the, the kids yeah. are already all snapping. Too late. That's it. They're all snapping. You know? they're, they're, they're exchanging their, like, give me your snap. That's what, I don't know what the kids do. Um, but... <laughs> I do know a little bit about tech, and uh, we do we talk about it in French. So the only tech is where you want to go. Frenchspin.com. Thank you so much, Patrick Becha. And Brian, you're the greatest. Keep your oh. his, your history hat on. He's the host <laughs> of the Ride Home on the uh, TechMean.com. You can see it 5 p.m. Is that 5 p.m. Pacific or Eastern every Eastern? Because uh, I'm I'm here in New York, but then you know. Uh, we because we want to try to I would say that it's it's pretty 50 50 and then 30 percent of the audience is overseas. So that really doesn't oh, wow. matter. You can you wow. can listen in the morning <laughs> on your ride in if you want to. But uh, and yeah, the idea is, is I, I'm trying to catch you up on most things that happened. If something crazy happens. Uh, then I will. I'm sure I can run back in and re-record. So maybe the <laughs> the California people would get something a little different than the New York people. But we we'll do the breaking news here. You could just keep doing the 5 p.m. thing. Cool. <laughs> uh, I'm so thrilled to have you on and come back really soon. Okay, Brian. Brian. Will McCullough. do. Yeah. Really, really enjoyed. Uh, as they said in the chat room, enjoyed your perspective. We thank you everybody for coming. We had a great studio audience today. Some very bored children. A couple of board spouses, <laughs> but everybody else is having a good time, right? Uh, if you want to be in studio, all you have to do is email tickets at twit.tv. The tickets are free, but we do like to know ahead of time that you're coming so we can put a chair out for you. And we just love having a live audience, so thank you. You can also watch live on the stream, and there are, there's there's value in that for us, too. If you watch at uh, twit.tv slash live, join us in the chat room because I watch the chat room like a hawk the whole time. And as you've heard several times through the show, the chat room is a great asset to us, irc.twit.tv. But it's most useful if you're watching during the live programming because then we get, you know, feedback from the live show. Uh, if you can't watch live, and I understand everybody's got a life, everything we do is on demand, uh, audio and video, at our website, twit.tv, or subscribe in your favorite podcatcher, and that way you'll get it every week the minute it's available. We record the show Sunday, 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific, that's a noon, not noon, midnight UTC, right? Is that right? Is that what it is in Finland right now? Is it the middle of the night? Well, in Finland, the sun is coming up now. It's almost Holy 4 a.m. I am sorry, yeah. Patrick. Oh, my God. I'm glad I didn't Patrick's know that hero. before. I feel terrible. <laughs> it's Well, that's why I, I couldn't make it for a few months. Uh, and actually... I don't know if you heard it, but the baby woke up and cried quite a bit in the middle of the show. Didn't hear a thing. Uh, and I, I, that I admire you as a father for not moving. <laughs> for not going to the baby. <laughs> Honey, the baby's crying. <laughs> it's Honey. three in the morning. Can you wake up and take care of it? Thank you. <laughs> Honey, you got what he wants, not me. Get in here. <laughs> It's but great. yes, it's, it's midnight. Thank you for staying uh, up late. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Patrick. <laughs> thank you all for being here, and we will see you next time. Another twit is in the can. Bye-bye.